Hi, everybody. My name is John Bell, and this is the Harbinger Report. And uh, as I told everyone last week in my preparation in my last show, we have a fantastic guest with us today. So my last show was about the trying to introduce people that aren't aware about the secret space program and how the U.S. government, as well as other agencies, have had a secret space program that's been operational at least since the 1980s actually functioning in fleets operating in space. And as I told you last week, uh, there was in preparation for this show, because this show, we actually have a man that served in the space fleet for 20 years. All right. And uh, so I'm going to get him to uh, give a bio on himself and explain his own story. So audience, this is uh, Daryl James. And Daryl, why don't you uh, tell the audience a brief bio on yourself and how this all started for you? Um, my name is Daryl James. I joined the Navy in 99, January of 99. I did, uh, almost five years in battalion and I'm CB seven. And then, um, I've all, I, I went over, I got stationed over in uh, St. Morgan, England. I reenlisted, got stationed there. And, um, I, when I got picked up from the, uh, you know, the, the bus station, the first class petty officer, he took me to McDonald's and he said, you know, this is a really weird base. He, that's all he really said. He thought it was a strange base. And um, so I, I went to the base um, and on the first Monday I was there, somebody came in and said, you have to go to the underground base and escort some civilian workers from the corporation Siemens into the base. And I worked in the garage. I really, I didn't work in the underground base. I worked in the garage, like on the other side of the base. And um, so I went over and I, I met the guy, met the people at the quarter deck. And <clears throat> first thing we did is we walked through. Uh, there was like a sliding door, like a, a, a like a glass door, like a plexiglass door that slid open. And um, there was a metal detector. It looked like as soon as you walked in. And there was an English guard with a rifle on his shoulder behind like a stainless steel table. And the first guy said, I'm not walking through that bloody thing. So he walked around the metal detector. So I just thought, well, I don't want to walk around it, walk through it either if, if he doesn't want to walk through it. So I went to walk around it and that guard said, no, you walk through. So I looked at it and it just looked like a, like, you know, it had two sides, like a, like a little roof and it had like a little ramp over it with that black and yellow caution tape over it so you wouldn't trip. So I, I just thought, well, it's a metal detector, and I walked through. They fixed the pump. I watched them fix the pump, and that was about it, and I left. And um, then I had a uh, ball of the four watch, and when I walked into the – that's like 12 o'clock at night to 4 in the morning, like 0, 00 to, to 4 a.m., on a Friday, and when I walked in, I saw Michael Aquino, <clears throat> who was like a Satanist. I uh, started the Temple of Set. He was part of the whole um, uh, presidio about the kids that said they were taken through a tunnel. It was an army base in California where 
in the daycare center on the base, these kids claimed that they were taken through a tunnel and they wound up in Aquino's house and things like that. And um, so I saw him there and he was in his dress uniform, army uniform, and he was looking through some papers on the desk of the quarter deck. He was standing up and he was looking through papers and he saw me and he said, oh, hey, how you doing? And I said, uh, good, sir. And asked me how I liked England and I, I knew who he was and he just he kind of gave me the creep so I just said you know excuse me sir and I, I left and I was doing rover watch which is like you, you walk around the base to make sure nothing's going on and um so that was that and then I on the next Friday I had another balls of four watch which is strange because you know that's the worst watch you could have and it's on a Friday and they usually don't do that to you unless you mess up and I wasn't doing anything wrong and uh so I had another one and the first class petty officer of the watch, he was sitting behind the desk of the quarter deck and he pointed at the computer monitor and he said, uh, what do you think about that? And I stood up and I looked at the computer and I thought it was just like a picture of like your stereotypical gray. And it was just standing there looking up at a camera, it looked like. And then he's, I said, what did you get that off the internet? And he said, no, look. And next to that sliding door, there was this big window and it stopped about six inches from the ceiling and about six inches from the floor. And this thing was standing behind this glass window, this plexiglass window. And uh, he said, uh, do you mind if it comes in here? And I, I said, does it mind if I stare at it? Because I was really scared. I was very scared. I like, it was freaky. It had uh, big black eyes. It was kind of light brown, like a khaki brown. It had like a fold of skin from its tear ducts that went kind of down its cheekbones, like a, like a fold of skin. And uh, had very long fingers. Like it looked like it could, long palm and long fingers. It looked like it could pick something up off the ground without even bending its back. And um, what was the shape of the head? I mean, it looked like a gray kind of thing. Yeah, typical. it was like, you know, a typical, like tiny, small at the chin. And then it kind of mm -hmm. went up and got bigger. But it was only probably about three and a half feet tall, I would mm -hmm. say. And um, had a slit for a mouth. I think it had slits for nostrils. No navel, no nipples, no genitals. And uh, yeah, like I said, when I said, does it mind if I come in here? Yeah, there he is. I, I said, uh, I remember in my head, I heard a voice said, I don't mind. Like it was like it kind of like saying it to me. And it was like, just like they say, it's kind of like the voice in your head. You, you hear it. And the door slid open and he walked out and the guard was right behind him. That same guard that was behind the stainless, stainless steel table, the English guard was, he had like a beret and, uh, it had a small pistol in its hand. It looked like polished metal. And uh, I just got back from Iraq and I said, gun, gun, gun. And then it still kept on coming at me and I stood up and I yelled gun. And they all said, it's not a gun, <clears throat> including it, just like before, like in my mind. And it held its hand out and showed it to me. And it, it, like I said, it looked like a pistol. So in my head, I'm going through all these scenarios like star trek like is it a syringe or something is it going to take a sample from me is it going to inject me with something i didn't know and on the ground <clears throat> there was just this junky government issued dell computer like this old dell computer but it was actually a drill it wasn't a gun and it took it apart like a machine like it didn't have to guide the bit in or anything it's just like that and it was catching the screws in its hand the whole time Went to the side, the back, the other side, slid off the top. It popped out two gigs of RAM, put it on top of the table. There were two more already waiting for it. It was short, so I had to reach up, grab two more gigs of RAM, put them in, slid it back down, and it kind of like flicked its hand forward. Like it still had the, the screws, and it was kind of like setting it between its fingers. And it just put it together almost as fast as it took it apart. Hmm. And then it stood there in front of me and just let me like observe it like look at it and i kind of went like that and it moved its head for me and stuff like that and i looked at its hands and it was moving its hands back and forth for me and uh i leaned to touch it and the first class petty officer he, he said don't touch it and so then i just stopped and the whole time i was like pinching my my thigh mm -hmm. because it was kind of you know i'll get into it later while i was doing that did, did you try to ask it any questions since it was speaking to your mind 
I did. I did. I, I said in my head, do you mind? If, can I touch you? Because I, right. I, it was almost like I wanted to make this real. You know, it, it didn't seem real to me. And I felt like a physical interaction would make this more real. And um, I had a lot of adrenaline. I was really fight or flight. I was scared. And um, <clears throat> I got kind of bored with it and it walked away. Like I, I was kind of looking around at the other people and it walked away and it walked back through the uh, sliding glass doors and the guard went behind him. And he said, what do you think about that? The first class petty officer. And I, I said, you know, pretty weird. And he said, uh, do you think you can work around something like that? And I think that's what it was for. I think it was to see my reaction. If I'd run away, if I'd attack it, well, what would I, what would I do? And uh, he says, uh, he says, you're pinching yourself. Do you think you're dreaming? And I said, no, I want to have a mark in case you guys erase my mind. So maybe I'll remember this. You know, that's that's to... brilliant. That's brilliant. That's a psychological trick called anchoring. And if you want to if you want to remember something, you're, it, this even comes from studies of the ancient Greeks and how they learned information. But you can create an anchor by making a physical contact. You'll see a psychologist do this oftentimes by when they say something to you, they want you to remember stick. They'll tap you as they say it. And it's an anchoring. So that, that was brilliant on your part. Did you have any prior psychological training to know that? No, no. I just thought like I have to give myself like a, and I was doing it. I gave myself a blood blister, you know, like I was doing it as hard as I could because I was thinking you guys are going to wipe my mind after seeing something like this. <laughs> so I have to give myself a mark to so I'll remember this. And uh, he said, no, we're not going to wipe your mind. Not yet. He was kind of talk. He was saying things like I really don't understand. And I was really like, you know, <clears throat> I was standing up and pacing, running my fingers through my hair. Like I was just, high, you know, after an adrenaline dump, you know, you, you feel weak and nauseous and, you know, your knees are, are shaking and stuff like that. It's difficult to walk. So I had a really bad adrenaline dump. And um, he said, uh, you're smart. And I, I said, really? He goes, yeah, like really smart. And I said, well, how smart? And he said, I said, you know, 140, 150 IQ. And he said, more like 190, 195. And I said, well, how do you know that? And he said, you see that machine you've walked through? And I said, yeah. He said, uh, it's a total diagnostic. It's like a total scan of your body. It, 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 he was telling me things like you smoke because I smoked at the time. And he said, but you don't have any clots. That's because you drink because I drank at the time. You know, so he could tell me like all these, all this stuff about me. So it was like a complete scan. And, um, yeah, he started asking me things like, do you have any hobbies? And I said, I used to play classical guitar, you know, in, in high school. And I stopped about 19. And he's like, oh, they'll really like that. And he was saying like they. And he, he said, well, with your scores, you'll be an officer. So you'll have plenty of time to practice. And I really didn't know, know what he was talking about. And he uh, he said, and then he said, that, I said, who are you talking about they? And he said, there's Germans up there. And I said, where? He goes, he goes in, he goes in the moon and, and further on. He really didn't say space. He didn't call it space. He goes, it's further on. He said, I said, do you mean like Germans from Germany? And he's like, yeah, from the 30s and 40s. He said, some of them are from modern day Germany, but mostly from the 30s and 40s. And I really didn't know what he's talking about. You know, like I, I didn't understand. And Yeah, I, you didn't have a base to process that from. You know what I mean? Yeah, because well, and the other guys that usually get into this program, they were they were um they worked in the underground base, so mm. and they would tell stories and stuff like that of stuff they saw, like in the barracks. I lived in the barracks. Tell stories, but yeah, like you know that happened. Yeah, and showing you the gray—that's a typical story from from people that talk about this or people that work around these things. They're doing two things: they're testing you to see your reaction, but they're also trying to desensitize you by showing these things because they, they always typically do that before they show you reptilians and things like that. They're more disturbing. So they're trying to create, I always talk about something that Plato said and I bring it up almost every show, but it's so important to understand. I'd have a degree in philosophy. And uh, one thing Plato said is you can't know something you don't already know. And what he's talking about is the way the human brain processes information. And if we don't have a base to understand what we're seeing for something for the first time, it's very difficult for the brain to process that. So them understanding that, they're creating a base for you by showing you the gray before you move on to scarier things. Yeah, well, ET say a similar thing. They'll tell you something once, and if you don't listen, they'll say you need the experience. It's kind of like what, like you need the actual physical interaction experience to understand. This. And yeah, so... 
that happened. Um, and then, uh, so that was a Friday and a Saturday. I, I you know, I, I woke up and I immediately looked at my thigh and I had the mark. I had the blood blister. But it was weird. It was almost like, you know, when your mind can't really under like really comprehend something, you kind of just, okay, that didn't happen. You know what I mean? You kind of like that, that couldn't have happened. And you just kind of like put it away. And one of the guys came up to me. He was kind of like the the gossip on the base. Everybody called him uh, Lando because he liked Star Wars, Lando Carizian. And uh, he said, what did you think? And I said, what? And he said, you know, big black eyes, long spindly fingers, kind of creepy looking. And I said, oh, yeah. And I said, I forgot. And he said, oh, some people do. You know, like I, I kind of just made myself forget. And um, yeah, so that happened. And then on Monday, the XO came directly to the garage, which, you know, that doesn't really happen. They, they might call you to their office, but, you know, they don't come to you. And he came directly to where I worked. And one of the guys came up to me and said, uh, you know, hey, James, the XO wants to see you. And I said, well, has this ever happened before? And he said, no. And um, I went out and I walked with him and we were walking, you know, just small talk at first, things like, how do you like England, things like that. And then once we got further and far enough away from the uh, building, he, you know, asked how I, what I thought about the gray that I saw and, you know, interesting, isn't it? And I said, yes. And he asked me if I've ever heard of Solar Warden. And uh, well, he asked me. He asked me if I ever heard of Gary McGinnon, as well. And Gary McGinnon, this was like a uh, current event at the time. He was from England, and this happened. You know, yeah, yeah, Gary McGinnon. There you go. And uh, he asked me if I heard of him, and I said no. And I said I was on Iraq, you know, for several months, so I really didn't get a hold of the news. And he said. Uh, Everything is true is basically what he told me as far as what Gary McGinnon found. Uh, you know, uh, names, ranks, social security numbers of extraterrestrial officers. Yeah, uh, and for, the, craft. for people that might not know in the audience, I, I covered him on my last show. That's why I had the picture queued. But uh, Gary McKinnon, he's from Scotland. Many people say he's, he's British. He's actually from Scotland. But he was living in London, and he's mildly autistic. Um but he was a computer hacker and he broke into the U S Pentagon hacking in. And he also broke into NASA and some other places, some high level sensitive places, but mainly the Pentagon, he ended up, he ended up getting busted and he got into a lot of trouble and our government tried to, to um, they tried to get him deported to the U S so that they could basically throw him in a prison and make the prison uh, and throw away the prison. That's what they told him. But uh, his mother actually was a, um, she was in the, 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 what do you call it? She was in the, the musical scene where she knew all the, she was like a producer or something for all the famous uh, uh, rock stars in England, like the Rolling Stones and Sting and things like that. So she literally put on concerts with, and, and try to get politicians involved, all for the sake of protecting her son from getting uh, sent back to the United States uh, for uh, getting deported for them to then uh, punish him for this crime. They went after him for over 10 years. And then finally the U S government decided to drop the case. But what he found just as Daryl just mentioned, that he found, he broke in, he found uh, the, the project solar warden by the U S government, which was an off world United States military space fleet that was in operation. He found ship to ship transfer forms of supply chains he found lists of terrestrial and extraterrestrial officers meaning officers in our military that do not work on planet earth and he found photographs uh, he found a picture of one of the carrier groups sitting in orbit just outside the planet and um and yeah they wanted to they wanted to go after him hard so um if it wasn't for his mother and her connections yeah, he uh, he probably wouldn't be among us right now, but yeah. What yeah, year was that for you? Oh, that was probably what 
2002, maybe 2003, probably 2002 that happened. It was during the war, so it kind of just everybody just kind of forgot about it because it was there's so much coverage of the Iraq War. <clears throat> and um, well, one of the things Robert told me was what they didn't bring up. The main reason they didn't extradite him is because he would have been able to call witnesses in court. Okay. And yeah, it would have blew the lid off Solar Warden. So that's what, like, they didn't. He he said they don't. They didn't bring that up. But like, that's like, you know, the lawyers all got together and talked about it and said, well, if we extradite him, he'll be able to call witnesses. And that makes the true. that makes a good point. But shortly after that is when they instituted the Patriot Act and uh, National Defense Authorization Act, which means you don't get to present witnesses. You don't get uh, lawyers. You don't get a phone call. You don't get a court. You just get sent away. But that all came after that time. So he, he's lucky. That wouldn't yeah. happen today. <clears throat> yes. And yeah, he said it's all true. All that's true. And now Tell the audience, you, you just mentioned Robert. Tell the, them who Robert is. Yeah, Robert was the XO. Yeah, he was the executive officer of the base. And I really didn't, you know, I didn't know him. I, I was brand new to this base. And um. <clears throat> I mean, I, I could go in later on in the story about <clears throat> how I knew him more in, in the story. And we'll, we'll come back to that. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but, yeah, and he, he started telling me about uh, Project Solar Warden. And he said, uh, you know, there's a secret space program, the 20 year and back. He said, if you do, uh, he said, you'll do 20 years. We'll send you back in time 20 years erase your memory and age regressing 20 years and you'll wake up in bed like nothing happened is pretty much what he said to me and that is what the 20 and back program is as crazy as that may sound to new listeners mm -hmm. they actually have technology they've gotten from other alien races and they've signed treaties with those races on how you have to operate this and how you've got to return the person after 20 years so they take you you are sent to training then you spend 20 years serving in this program. And if you have uh, a, a longer training, they can even time loop that so it doesn't take away from your 20 and back time. But then at the end of that time, they erase your memory and they age regress your body and they and your mind and they put you back to within 15 minutes of the time that you were actually were taken because sometimes people are taken or that you volunteer to enter the program. Yeah, and he, yeah, he told me about it, <clears throat> and he said, uh, he said, and, and with your scores, I guarantee you'll make pilot. You'll make commander, and you'll make pilot. <clears throat> and I said, <clears throat> excuse me, and I, he, he said, you'll make pilot of a four-kilometer-long starship, is how he put it. And he told me it looked similar to the ships from Battlestar Galactica, is what he said. And... Um, I don't know. It seemed kind of far fetched to me, and I, I said, uh, you know, I could believe in going back in time and getting your mind erased, but I, I said there's something about age regression I find hard to believe. And he said, after what you just saw, you find that hard to believe. I said, well, touche, sir, but yes. And he said, well, it's true. He wasn't interested in trying to convince me any further. <clears throat> we were talking, and I, I said to him, I said that that machine. I walked through, it, it, it could tell everything. It could tell your IQ, your, if you had clots in your body, every, everything. And he said, yes. And I said, well, my father died of a heart attack when I was 19 of something called a Widowmaker, which was just like a clot. We didn't know it was there and it broke loose and he died. And I said, with technology like that, that would have saved his life. And he, he talked, he talked about, you know, population control. We can't bring this out to the public, things like that. And I said, well, there has to be a side that wants to bring this to the public. And he said, you mean like a traitor? And I said, no, sir. I said, there just has to be like a faction or a side or something like that that wants to bring this out to the public. And he said, well, there is. And I said, well, if you can get me on that side, I'll do it. And um, so we walked and a little bit further and I shook his hand, saluted him. And as he was walking away, he said, one more thing, Mr. James. And he was calling me Mr. this whole time, too, which in like the Navy, that means like an officer. So he was already kind of like referring to me as an officer. He wasn't calling me Petty Officer James. He was calling me Mr. And he said, one more thing, Mr. James. You're going to be escorted by a reptile and he's big. 
And I, like in my mind, I was like, all right. Like, I didn't even know what that meant. You know what I mean? And uh, so, yeah, that was it. And I remember one time <clears throat> we were, we used to, you know, the game Halo was out on the Xbox and we used to play it in the barracks. And it, it, it was two different things. And one time it was, we were waiting for the next game and the guys said, hey, did you see that reptile today? And another one said, yeah, he was big. And so in my head, I'm thinking, like, there must be, like, four-legged reptiles that live in the caverns or something underground. I didn't really know what to think. And the other one said, yeah, and he talked funny, too. And I said, what? You know. And the guy said, oh, yeah, you're new here. Yeah, there's reptiles that live underground. And I said, there's, like, four-legged reptiles that talk to you? And they go, no, no, they, they walk upright like us. They, they have two feet and two hands. and They're, just, they're like us, but they're reptiles. And uh, he, one of the guys said, don't worry, you'll see. And I just kind of thought they were messing with me because I was the new guy. And um, another day, you know, and this was like probably two days later, we were playing Halo again. And this one guy said, I joined the secret space program. And he said, uh, I worked in the mines of the moon. He said they put uh, shot collars around them. <clears throat> if they didn't work, they'd get shocked. They had, they, worked, they had these working groups, and if somebody in the group didn't work, they'd shock everybody as like a mass punishment. And he said there were brothels, and he got to sleep with all these women, and he was like, yeah, it was great. And uh, I said, well, the XO came up to me and said that I would become the pilot of a four-kilometer-long starship. Did he say that to you? And he said, no. He said, you're going to be up there. He's like, they're going to take good care of you. Because I thought like maybe the XO told this to everybody. And just try to get him in and i'd wind up like as a slave on the moon or something whatever he was talking about and um yeah all of a sudden there was like a feedback loop <clears throat> oh and the guy said to me he said he said um well they'll put you in a chair when you come back and if you fight it you'll remember he said he said that's how he remembered oh interesting yeah and all of a sudden there was like a a feedback loop in the room and it said something like now hear this, now hear this. You are now in violations of Section 4 and 5 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. If you do not stop right now, you could be fined up to $10,000 or you know $100,000 in fines or in 10 years in prison. That'll be all, and it went away. And I said, you know, I looked around, and I said, is there a speaker in here? And the guy said, no, with the technology they have, they don't need speakers. One of the guys said that. And I said, well, what was it? <clears throat> And he said, uh, he said, we should stop talking about it. They're listening to us right now. And the next day, that same guy, uh, Lando, came up to me. And um, he said, did you hear that voice in the room? And I said, yes. <clears throat> and he said, you see those blocks on the uh, radio tower near the underground base? And th there were like these rectangular blocks on the, on the actual dish, like the radio tower on the base. And this was like you know, 2003, 2004. And he said, that's something called 5G technology. It's experimental here. He said they could put a microwave beam. They could, they can create a microwave beam with that, that 5G, put it into a room. They can hear everything. They can see everything and they can talk to you if they want. So it's like a way to bug your house without even like having to break in and put a, put a bug in. So it's, you know, it's just a way to bug your, he said they can just put a beam right in there and they can hear and see everything. And yet our government now is putting 5G into everything everywhere. Mm. You know, did this look uh, anything just for the audience? They have a visual of, of what you saw. I mean, no, it was like, it was like a light brown. It was a light brown. It was, you know, it, and like I said, it had that fold of skin and I don't think it, it didn't have eyelids. I remember it did not blink. Okay. It was similar to that. And they had right. the small, you know, it was a similar head and everything, but it didn't blink. I remember that too. Like it didn't have eyelids. And, and what uh, about as far as the reptilian? The reptilian I saw, yeah, eventually <clears throat> he did look similar to that, but he was brown, like a dark brown. And they don't have muscles, but more like that. Yeah, ridges. And it was a very dark brown. And the way its mouth went across, it came straight up. And uh, yeah, it had the ridges on the head like that too. And um, so, you know, I heard later on 
I think after I came back from the program, uh, but I didn't rec know what was happening. Guys were talking, saying that he went back into the chair. Like he couldn't take his memories. Like he remembered, but he couldn't take the memories. So he went back in the chair. And so, yeah, like the moment of truth came and um, it was a Friday again. And the guy told me to, well, I had to sign like a bunch of paperwork like that, like, like a mortgage on a house. And the paperwork was really strange. It was things like uh, the consciousness of the first party now belongs to the second party and things like that. So well, as I was reading it, I said, I don't know about this. Like I, I told the first class, it, it will, I was trying to read it. And he said, if you read this, we'll be here all night. <laughs> and uh, I said, I, I don't I don't know. I got kind of freaked out by it. And he said, you're already back there. So just sign the damn papers. When and I got like a chill because it was like I, I realized I was in a time loop. Like that's yep. like the moment. Like I realized I was in a time loop. That's the thing. You, you're still going through the introduction, and then you find out you're already back. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and I was being age regressed is what it was because that's like a I said that's a long process to age regress somebody. It's like a week long. They send you back like a little bit earlier so they can age regress you. It's like a week long process. And. uh so I, you know, I was like, I even like, I, you know, people say you shouldn't sign a contract without, you know, reading it. And I understand that. And I was trying to, but I felt I, I was, I thought I was going to do it for something. You know what I mean? It's what it felt to me. You know, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this for dad. And I, I said that to myself and I started signing everything. You know, he was doing the initial here, sign here, flipping the pages for me. Cause it was just so much. And he was telling me everything was already X to sign next to and everything like that. It was all pretty right. Important. Just like a house mortgage, like you said. Exactly. It was, about, it was about as big as a house mortgage, yeah. Well, before the show, we, we were talking about this subject, and you explained how um, why the 20 and back is the 20 and back versus, say, 40 and back and all. Can you explain that for the audience? Yeah, yeah. When you do 20, at the end of it, they'll go to you and they'll ask you if you'd like to do another um, 20 years. So you can do a total of 40. <clears throat> and the reason is, the XO told me this, that guy, Robert, he uh, he said that if you if your age regress more than forty years, it, it can do psychological damage to you. So it can actually drive you crazy, it can make you insane. So they don't look, want you to do any more than forty years, because they pretty much just want you to like go to your same life that you had with with no recollection. Is kind of what it is. And uh, so I signed everything. He said, "Sit down." Um, I sat down. He got on the phone. He said, send him in. And then I waited for about five, ten minutes. And then he said, all right, go with him. And he pointed at that same window. And behind that window was this, this huge reptile. It was big. It looked like that one you uh, showed before. He had bridges going down his head, kind of. Um, mouth went straight across. up, And um, he was probably, gosh, I want to say nine and a half feet tall. I would say, and really big muscles, big shoulder muscles. He was wearing one of those tight blue suits that you see like ETs wear and stuff, kind of like that. And like skin tight? Yeah, like a skin tight, like blue suit. And yeah, he uh, he said, go with him. And I stood up and I said, he's not going to eat me, is he? And he said, he's stronger than you and faster than you. If he wanted to eat you, he would have done it by now. And there was like this other guard that came in, a, a different one, one I never saw, like a skinny kid. And so it eventually walked out and walked out into the room. So I stood up and I started walking with it. And the uh, kid kept on butt stroking me in the back. He kept on hitting me with the rifle, with his rifle he had. And, you know, he was behind me and the reptile was in front of me and I was like in between. And in this underground base, they were like... Uh, White stripe, blue stripe, and red stripe, and red one everywhere. That was like above top secret, and then you know white was secret, blue was top secret, and then red one everywhere. And there were certain hallways that were dark, or that were only red. And he immediately went down those hall one of the one of those hallways that was dark. And when I first walked in, I thought like maybe you know with the the Siemens guys, I thought maybe there's a, a motion sensor or something, and the light turns on. And there was nothing. So I thought, I guess these things can see in the dark pretty well. And uh, so I was following kind of close to it. So I wouldn't lose track of them because it was so dark. 
and uh, the kid the kid kept on butt stroking me and butt stroking me, and I said like, could you please stop hitting me? I'm not doing anything, you know, I'm not looking around, you know, don't stop hitting me. And then he hit me really good between the shoulder blades. And I turned around and I grabbed his weapon and I put my legs behind his and I threw him on the ground and I, I held it out in front of him by like the barrel. And I said, if you hit me with this thing one more time, I'm going to shove it up your ass sideways. And the reptile said, leave us. And it, but their voice is kind of, you know, describing their voice, it's kind of like speaking isn't natural to them. It was deeper than any man could be. But then it was like kind of like that last syllable. He had to push out and it got higher pitch. So it was like, leave us. It was kind of like that. And uh, the kid got up. And he was looking at me, looking at his weapon, looking at me, looking at his weapon. And I just held it out. And he grabbed it and he, and he took off. And when I turned around, the reptile was like right here in front of me. And he was looking down over his you know, chest muscles. I could see his eyes. He had like gold alligator eyes, it looked like. And, uh, and he was just flexing all his muscles to show, him how, show me how big he actually was. And... I remember I said, I'm sorry what, what I said before, you're much more civilized than him. And they don't bare their teeth or furrow their brow. They, uh, the only reason you could, you know, there's no muscles, just like a reptile. Only way you could tell they're aggravated with you or, or angry at you is their eyes get like small. He was kind of squinting at me. And when I said that, his eyes got opened up normal and he turned around and he walked away. And he said, he said follow me. And I started following him. The, the reptilians started, are huge on respect, and uh, you showed him respect at that point, so he calmed him down. Yeah, yeah, like because you know, I I, I said he's going to eat me. Oh, and yeah, like when I said that, like he 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 sighed behind this glass window, and I said, he, "Is he a telepath?" Because the last one can read my mind. I said, "Can you read my mind?" And he said, "Yes, he can read my mind." I remember in my head, I said, "Sorry about that." Like I didn't want to offend him because he was so big. <laughs> right. Right. And, I, I got to look around and there were like things like bicycles leaning against the wall and like golf carts because we were like yeah. gradually walking down like a hill. Like it felt like so if you had, if, you know, if I was there, I would have been asking him like every question I could possibly think about. <laughs> I was, I was still kind of scared. It was dark. I was a little right. scared. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, very, it's very intimidating and shock and awe and you're still trying to process what's happening. Yeah, I've never seen anything this big. It, he was literally like nine and a half feet tall. I've never seen anything this big, like human or any, you know, like maybe an elephant. You know what I mean? He was like that big. And, and uh, yeah, eventually we got to like, it looked like it was like a catwalk, like steps going up the side of a wall, like three steps. And then it was like a, a, a watertight door, it looked like, with the wheel on it and everything like that. And the door was already open. And, uh, we walked up and he was in there and I walked in and there was a chair, but it was very big. Like it was made for one of them. And Robert later on told me that they're fourth density beings and that this was a density ch chamber. They're, we're third density beings. We have the capability of going up one density, the fourth through meditation, concentration, because fourth density is like astral plane kind of thing so people astral projecting and things like that so we have the ability to go up one density naturally but the reptiles don't have the ability to go from fourth to fifth and fifth densities are is kind of like where the mover and shakers are of like the universe it's like it's like in the middle kind of like it's, it's that middle area so that they created this technology to push themselves up in the fifth density and that's what it was called it was called the density chamber and uh now so could it could it bring you to fourth and then fifth, or or did you? No, it, just, it, first? It, it passes fourth and goes all the way to fifth. It just takes you right to fifth. Is what mm. this thing does. And I don't think it, I asked him, "Can it go to six? And he said, "No." He's like, "He, he can't go any higher than fifth. But it's, it's did, did they explain the technology, how it functions, or works at all? I mean, he, he told me the reason it had the sealed door was because it had the build up pressure to push you up in the fifth density. And also so the density wouldn't leak out and affect anybody else outside of the chamber. That's why he said it, it needed to be sealed like that. And um, when I saw this chair, it had, you know, holes in it, straps for your, your wrist and your, your ankles. I thought it was a gas chamber. Because I saw the door and everything. Because when I was a kid, they took, you know, we had the D.A.R.E. program, which is, you know, like an anti-drug program. And they brought like a, a gas chamber chair 
to elementary school when I was like six or seven and they showed it to us. And it just really scared me just to think of how many people died on this thing and everything else. And that's what I thought it was. And I said, no, I'm not doing this. And I ran out and it grabbed me by the, by the neck. It just threw me into the chair. Like I weighed nothing it slammed me in. And I was like kind of struggling with it. And it, its hand was so big. It could like fit over my forearm and the arm of the chair. You know what I mean? It was like holding my hand down and strapping me in. And I pulled its thumb up. I started getting it like up. And it had like these black nails. Like it was dark brown, but it had these nails that kind of like they went out. You know what I mean? But then they kind of full rolled in to each other and created like needle points. So he had like regular nails like us, but as they went out, they kind of rolled into each other. The sides did and created like points. So he had like almost like needle kind of nails. And uh, yeah, he headbutted me, I think, or something or hit me. And I, I kind of blacked out and I came to, and he had my, then he had my right, you know, in my, my right uh, ankle in. So the chair was so big and high up, I kind of like was able to step down to the ground and I was undoing my wrist and he just threw me back in the chair and his fingers were up here and his hand was here. That's how big he was. And he leaned in real close and he made almost like that, like that alligator mating call where you can feel the rumble but you can't really hear it but then you hear it like later you know what I mean it's like a percussion almost I could feel it in my chest like the rumble and it, as as he got closer to my face I could then hear it and he said don't make me hit you again and when he got real close like that I just jammed my thumb in its eye and it kind of leaned back and closed its eye and all it did was lean forward until it collapsed my chest and hit my heart and I just blacked out and I came to and everything was strapped in and he said uh I'm sorry I have to do this to you, is what he said. And uh, so he, there was like something on the wall, where, on the same wall that the door was on, a control panel of some sort. I couldn't really see it, but I could just see him doing things. And he walked out and he closed the door. And I was hyperventilating. I was doing, you know, I was like trying to make myself pass out so I wouldn't feel the gas or whatever was going to happen to me. You know what I mean? I was like, really, I was hyperventilating so I could pass out so I wouldn't feel it. And then it was almost like it felt like an out-of-body experience, kind of. It was like a cold, like weightlessness. And then it was just like like you were floating, like you were weightless. You know what I mean? It was just like a release from your body, it felt like. <clears throat> and then I came to, and I wasn't strapped in anymore. But I was still sitting in the chair. I wasn't strapped in. I looked over to my right, and there were three guys on a mattress on the floor, kind of all laying shoulder to shoulder. And it looked like they got picked up from like a nightclub or something or a pub, like they were kidnapped. And they were all like passed out in this chamber with me. And there was a guy who looked like a Gestapo. And he was facing towards the reptile. And the reptile had his back towards me. So I really couldn't see the reptile. And it looked like they were talking, like they were gesturing with their hands, like they were talking, but they weren't saying anything. And, you know, he had like his hair slicked back with pomade. He had like an undercut. He was blonde. He had like a black leather trench coat on. So he looked just like a Gestapo. And, uh, I slid out of the chair and I remember the one of the footrests hit me in the back and I, I like was kind of weaving and I was really weak and out of it. And I said, can I go to bed now? That was the first thing that came to my head. And I fell down to my hands and knees because I couldn't stand anymore. And I remember I saw his boots go into my field of vision and he said, I should have you executed for what you did to my man. Do you hear me? And the reptile said, he does, it doesn't matter. He doesn't remember. And I just fell over and I collapsed. And I woke up and the reptile was holding me like a duffel bag kind of under its arm. and walking and my head was facing towards the back. And he was right on my bladder, his arm. And I said, I have to, you know, I have to go to the bathroom. Put me down. I have to pee. I was Because I, I was just so out of it. It was like, I can't even explain to you how strange it was. And uh, it didn't listen. And I, I said, I'm going to pee on you. And I, I just passed out. And uh, Robert la later on told me that he took me through a uh, looking glass is what it was. It was a portal that took you into the moon. Hmm. So it took you from this underground base. You walk through a portal and then boom, you're in the moon. Yeah. Can you explain the looking glass technology for the audience that's not familiar with it? Yeah. It's a way where you could go to different areas and you can also, I think you, you have to have another portal. Well, no, no, that's not true. You, you, can look at something in different periods of time. Cause later on he told me about, he saw my dad and things like that. He was, I had a conversation with him later 
you can go through different time periods of time and you could observe things or you could step through the looking glass like Alice in Wonderland and it's like a portal you could walk through it so you, it's either used for like observation or actually stepping through you know to go to another area or another period of time or both and yeah that's like the looking glass technology and um I woke I like a he laid me down on a bed and it was like, this like a regular medical bed. It had like railings on the side and stuff like that, like stainless steel railings. And it would, but it was big, like for one of them, it was very wide. And I looked up and I saw like, you know, like one of those big round hospital lights with the little LEDs all over it, little LED lights. And I, um, somebody started putting like stickers on my chest and, uh, like I heard t ripping and tearing. I heard people ripping open stuff. And I remember the reptile said he has to urinate. And I heard one long rip and uh, it was a woman and she put a catheter in me. And uh, I remember I saw her and I, I thought she was pretty. And I said, oh, you're really pretty. I said, can I hold your hand? And she said, yeah. And I just passed out holding her hand. And then I woke up the next day and I was in this room of all myself sitting on this chair. And she came in and she put her stuff on the table. She had like a bag, she put it on the table. And she started giving me like a physical and she had a smart glass pad, which I saw for the first time, which is like what the smartphone is based off of. It's like a, it looks like, like like a glass pad and you put your hands on either corner at the bottom and then like an image will appear and it, 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 it links with you telepathically is how it works. And she was just giving like I could I, I saw like a, a humanoid figure and she stuck her hand in the image and opened it up and then it was the heart. And then she could ever see all the circulatory system of the body and see how the heart was functioning. She went to the brain and things like that. And she went to leave. And uh, I said, wait. And she said, what? And I, I said, I don't know anybody here. And I just said the first thing that came to me, I said, I don't know what to do or say. I just don't want you to leave me. And she liked that. She like grabbed my hand. We walked out. And it looked like it was like changing of shifts because she was leaving. And it was mostly men like in gray jumpsuits. They were all like walking and they were wait and there was like a train behind us. Like we walked through this building and there was like this tram behind us and these guys were going into the tram. I was looking around and there was women. It looked like you were in the courtyard of a condominium where, you know, it was like that, you know, and it was like five levels up and there were women. Some of them had babies and they were waving at the men walking away. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were four lifts that came out of the ground. And they had no railings, you know, and they just kind of like levitated and they took you directly to where you wanted to go. And we got on one and it went up to the fifth floor and it took us right to a room. And she set her, her bag down and it was really very Spartan, you know, it was just like, like a desk, a couch, a coffee table, a bar area with like a kitchen area and then like a bedroom, a bathroom. And she took me into the bedroom and we started a kiss and she said, uh, wait, what's your name? And I said, I don't remember. And she said, think about it. Everybody remembers their name. And I thought about it. And I said, Daryl. And then we had sex and she was laying on my chest and my head was like on the headboard. And um, I dozed off and I woke up and I was just like back in England. Like, that's how it happened for me. Like, I remembered like those first couple days, but I remembered it, you know, like I remembered it like I was like I like I was just there. I had like kind of like images of like blonde hair, blue eyed people. I was in a lot of pain. I remember things like that. I was, you know, physical pain. And, <clears throat> but then I just woke up and I was back in England. And then I walked out of the barracks and that guy that was, he didn't you say you had a, didn't you say you noticed you had a mark too in your eye or something? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I, well, when I woke up, I had clay on the tops of my feet. I was a lot, I was very tome. I was, in, I was in like a lot of, I was in very good shape. I was very like muscular. It wasn't like overly muscular, but really good shape. And I, I was kind of like freaking out. So I ran my hands down my chest hair and I had burnt stubble on my chest hair and I ran it through my hair and I had burnt stubble in my hair. And, uh, um, yeah, this guy was waiting for me. He thought of himself as like top dog of the barracks, and he said, 20 years is a long time. You made it. Congratulations. But I didn't know what he was talking about. I was just freaked out. And so, yeah, that's like the introduction for me. Like, that, that was like my introduction, how it happened. I don't know if you have any questions. It goes on further. 
But uh, so that was my life. It was like I remember I had like really bad depression um, uh, for a long time. I didn't know what was wrong. And I drank on the bar on base every now and again. And uh, there were those these English people here. There were like uh, four four people like they're all British Army. And they they would uh, hang out at this bar. And then uh, I, I walked in and the one I called the goon, this big guy with like a shaved head. He said, hey, it's the king of the Tigetans is what he said. He said, he said, yeah, man. He's like, Aquino messed you up. He said he was torturing you. He had me doing things like smashing your toes. He said, I didn't want to do it. but and that was Michael, Michael Aquino? Yeah, Michael Aquino talking about him. And uh, yeah, that guy. And um, I, I said, I said uh, what's a Tigetan? And he asked me if I ever heard of Billy Meyer. And uh, I said, no, I never heard of him. And he's like, well, it's the Pleiadians, things like that. He said, you were claiming like you were a king or something like that. And he's like, you know, and he, he said that, you know, he said, that, you know, you said you killed me, but I didn't, I don't believe you. And there was this other girl who was like U.S. Navy and she was part of the satanic clique. And he, he said, like, you said you killed her, too. And, you know, he's like, but I don't believe you. And I had no idea what they're talking about. And the guys, the other guys were sitting at the bar said, um. You know, stop saying that stuff. You're not supposed to tell them things like that. And uh, so, I mean, that happened. And then for people that don't know, too, Billy Myers was a case. Uh, where did that take place at? I, he, I think it was Norway, somewhere in Scandinavia. He was a, yeah, he was a simple farmer. And uh, and and these aliens started appearing like on his backyard and in the sky around his farm. And they would have interaction with him. They would stop and talk to him and they would tell him, take photographs of us, of our craft. of, And it, it caused this huge stir. Um, and they said, you know, they didn't want to deal with the military. They wanted just a commoner and they chose him for some reason. But yeah, they're major. You can look that up um, to, to find out more information about Billy Meyer in his case. But it's a very interesting case. And I can tell you this, the government took it very seriously. So. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> so we're at the 4th of July party and something strange happened. We were cooking, you know, hot dogs and hamburgers. I was like serving at the time at the, like, the serving table. And the uh, XO came up and he had his daughter with him. And he said, uh, Petty Officer James, I'd like you to meet my daughter. Like he knew me. And I, I didn't, I don't, I didn't re remember the conversation we had at the time. And I really didn't know if I knew this guy. And uh, he introduced me to his daughter and I, you know, talked to her and I asked her out and she said no. And then he came up to me and he said, uh, he said, Betty Officer James, do you, do you play guitar? And I said, I used to when I was younger, sir. He's like, well, you should think about taking that back up. And then he just walked away. So that was just like a weird thing. Like I had weird things like that happen a lot. And I remember, I, you know, I smoked at the time and I remember being in the smoke area and this guy named, his name was just Rob or I forget his, you know, he was first class petty officer. And I was just standing there at the smoke pit. And he said, why aren't you smoking? And I said, I don't know. And I pulled out my pack of cigarettes and I've only had two missing. And I said, I've had this pack for two days. Like I've only been smoking because it was like, you know, because I was in the program so long, I didn't smoke anymore. I didn't have the craving to smoke anymore. So it was just like weird stuff like that. Plus these guys at the bar. So they're messing would, with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would go to this bar every now and again because this guy would like kind of tell me stuff like of a life that I didn't know I had. It, was, it seemed like, you know what I mean? So I was like interested, you know? And um, I remember one time we were watching Mission Impossible and uh, he said, I got to meet Tom Cruise the other day. And I, I said, really? And he said, yeah, he was in the underground base. And I said, why? And he said, he bought some adrenochrome from us. Mm. And I, I said, what, what's that? And he explained it to me. And I remember there was another time where they were yeah, all explain, acting. Explain the adrenochrome to the audience. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it will, they get it from like uh, prepubescent children because the number one thing they want is the uh, stem cells. It keeps you young, things like that. It makes you, you know, stronger, faster, it keeps you younger. And uh, they torture the children to get it. And, uh, what it does is it causes the adrenaline and that and that's a bonus it gives you like a high on top of it but the main reason they want it is for the youth to stay young for a long time and 
if it's they try to get the same blood type, but it's so rare and expensive that they can't always. So then they have to drink it. But if they can get the same blood type, they can inject it directly into the body, into the vein. And um, yeah, and he he said he went on the base. Uh, Tom Cruise. He said he was the main distributor for the Scientologists and things like that. And it was a military base that was. And great it was a military base. Form. And the thing, thing was, is the guys who were in the barracks, they said the same thing, but they weren't part of the clique of the, like the Satanists. They just saw him like walking around the base, the underground base. Um, the guys were talking, you know, they're all saying Tom Cruise was here. And where was this base? Was this still in St. Morgan, this England? This yeah, is this the same one. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. And they told me this and the guys who w just worked in the underground base said, yeah, he was here. And, and I asked them why. And they said they didn't know. Like, we don't know why he was there. And I just thought it was for a movie role or something, I guess. He was picking up a supply for Scientology. He, yeah. Robert later on told me that, yeah, he was the main distributor for the Scientologist. And uh, yeah, I had a run in with those guys when I was in Los Angeles and it was nothing nice. They even tried to tail me. They came out and questioned me one time when I was. I, I was I, I had some friends there. We were eating at um, this really nice restaurant called Prizzy's, and they make fantastic deep style pizza in Los Angeles. And right across the street was one of their little main Scientology buildings. And we went over there and we were talking. And apparently they were miking us from the bushes because they came. And we had a security guard come out, and he he knew what our conversation was. And at first he was asking some questions, and we were we were explaining. But then he starts getting like a little too personal or a little too like, you know, arrogant or whatever. So finally I was like, all right, dude, you, you can uh, kiss my butt and kiss off. You know what I mean? And so at that point it became somewhat confrontational. Next thing I know, they're tailing me and my buddy as we're leaving there. They actually have someone trying to follow me home. So I was like, <laughs> they don't know I was a state trooper. Let's see if they can follow me. So <laughs> I was like, watch this. And I lost the tail. And, uh, and, uh, and it was funny. My buddy was laughing, but yeah, they, they, uh, they take that stuff serious. They're, they're, uh, they're crazy. Oh yeah. And, yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, it's a shame. And, and it's not an accident that Tom Cruise looks the age he, he does at the age he is. That's not, that's not normal. You and know? That, that was something that Robert told me too when I talked to him later on. Was uh, he said, "How do you think Tom Cruise stays perpetually thirty-five years old?" And I said, right. "At the time, I said, isn't he thirty-five? He yeah, at the time, yeah, he, is, he is thirty-five. And, and what are you talking about? He, yeah, he said, just wait. He said, how do you think he stays that young? He said, you think it's plastic surgery? And I said, I never really thought about it. And he said, nobody does. He's like, that's how you know actors stay young for so long. But you know, you would think with that the level of technology that they have in the programs. Instead of having to do the adrenal chrome, which does huge resources and, and not a simple operation, it seems like they could just give them access to like the, the chair, or pot, or regression technology. Why don't they do that? They're not high enough up. That, you know what I mean? You have to be high. Like you, There's only a handful of people that are in these programs that actually have plus, access. We have treaties. Uh, plus, it was, it, was, it was alien technology that gave us this, this regression technology, and we have very strict treaties on how it can be used. Yeah, that and also um, the reptiles and they like it. The reptiles use it, and they they like the the louche, as it's called, where you know they like the pain and the suffering and things like that. They feed off that. They're kind of like a spiritual. Yeah. They're in the spirit realm. They're in They're very places. sadistic. Yeah. Yeah, cruel. Yeah, I, it, it's almost like they don't have kind of feelings. So when they experience something as strong as like fear and pain. It's like they almost get excited because they could almost feel it. You know what I mean? Because they right. really don't have that. They're reptilian. They, you know, they have a reptilian mind. They really don't experience things like laughter and love and pain. You know what I mean? They, they don't experience stuff like they're just kind of one level monotone like mindset the entire their entire life. That's actually a really good way of explaining it based on the the, the way I've heard about him. Almost like the emotionless face, you know, um, like that plays out into their character. And I'm sure they experience those things, too, but maybe not on the order or level that we are accustomed to. Uh, and we, we as human beings are known to have like really high emotion. We're seen as kind of like dangerous in a sense that we could do anything. You know what I mean? Because we're so emotional. Right. We're so emotional other, dangerous, right? Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. We're we're considered kind of dangerous, but uh, yeah. And I mean, I, I went through all these weird events where where people, 
you know, I don't know. Like oh, one time, um, <clears throat> that guy Lando came up to me and he said, uh, "Hey James, Johnson told me of this machine where it can extract your consciousness, your soul. You have to be. Uh, it has to be before puberty, but the body's mostly sedentary because it's used almost as like a like a vessel, a machine, by another consciousness." So they can't do it too young, like four or five years old, because the body would get sick and die with no movement. So they have to wait till about nine or 10 before puberty. And then they, they could extract the consciousness. And then another consciousness can kind of inhabit the body and use it almost like a puppet, like an avatar. And he said, that's what happened to a Kino. And it was almost like they were asking me questions and things like that to see if I had memories. And Robert later on told me that he had people actually kind of like posing as my friends. I guess you would say. Just oh, yeah, they're all, they're all feeding back it. reports. Yeah. Yeah, he was making sure I had no memory. So he told me all these different people that worked in the underground base. You know, I mean, I, I guess they were friendly to me, but it was more or less to kind of monitor me to see if I had any memories, if I ever talked about anything. And uh, so, yeah, time went on, and I was having, like, a really hard time. And I, like I said, I had depression and I, I started really drinking. Like I, I didn't drink that much. and I was drinking more and I was getting into trouble and it was just wrecking my life. It was just something that I knew there was something wrong, but I didn't know what it was. And there was something wrong with me. So I got out of the military and I did the whole thing of, uh, you know, you see the master chief of the base then you see the executive officer, then you see the commanding officer on your way out. Yeah. When you're getting out for your final time and, like you can say anything you want, you know, you can call him a jerk or whatever and you can't get in trouble, but you know, you can't that's, break the law. that's actually an old tradition, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and everybody's entitled to it, yeah. And you're allowed to give your opinion of the command and where they need to improve and things like that. And that's what, pretty much what it's for. And uh I saw the master chief and I didn't say much to him. He was like this overweight guy with glasses, and then I went to the XO's office and the XO he stood up slowly. And he looked sad, and then he just appeared at the end of his desk. And then I kind of thought in my mind that I just have a stroke. And then he just appeared right in front of me. <clears throat> and I took a step back, and he took a step forward. And in my head, I heard, "Can you hear what I'm saying to you?" And uh, in my, you know, I said yes back in my head. But it's almost like something that higher density beings do, where they want you to realize this isn't just the voice in your head that somebody's actually speaking to you. So they want you to make a physical gesture or say out loud, yes. And he said it again. He said, can you hear what I'm saying? And I nodded my head and under my breath, I said, yes. And then he said, what do you remember? And um, I said, I, I remember um, a woman with silver hair sitting down and she had a uh, boy on her lap and I kissed the boy and then I kissed her. And he said, that was mother. He said, you had a son with her. And I said, I have a son. And he said, you have dozens of sons and hundreds of daughters. Is what he That's told also me. common in the programs people don't know about. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, what? And he, and it was just mind blowing. And he was, and I was talking to him telepathically and I didn't know I could do that. And I, I was, you know, it was very unsettling. And he, he asked me, um, I told him, I remember like, he said, he said, what do you remember? I said, I, I was in, I was in, you know, I worked in mines or something like that. Cause I, I remembered that as he was telling me, as he was talking to me, I remembered more cause I didn't think about it. And I said, I knew this woman there. And he said, uh, that was April. And I, you know, I said, April who? And, um, you know, it was the military. I didn't know her last, I didn't know her first name. I only knew her last name. And he said her last name. And, uh, now, this was a different woman than the first few days of being in the program. No, right? this was the same woman, the, the one I, I held her hand with. And I like, you know, I, I slept, I fell asleep in bed with her and I woke up. That was the only, at the time, that was the only woman I really remembered. The guy even told me that the first class petty officer to watch, he said, some people will remember the first couple days, but then after that, they don't remember anything. So I remember like the first couple days. And uh, yeah, he said that was April. And you know, it was a woman that worked on the base and she was like an IT, but she joined the program. And I guess she was like a, <clears throat> a nurse. And that first class petty officer of the watch, he said, do you know the guy? He talked about the the one um, 
one of the guys who he got first place in the uh, PRT test every year, which is like physical readiness test. And uh, he said, that's me. He said, I joined the program. He said, don't tell him. But that kid was like, this guy was like 35 years old. And that kid was only like 18. He said, that's why I grow the mustache. He said, it's like a disguise. He had a blonde mustache. And I really didn't know what to think of it at the time. But yeah, Robert started telling me all this stuff. He just started telling me like, uh, he said, Daryl, something went wrong. You didn't go down in the third density properly. You need to go back into the chair. You still have your memory. You know? And I said, well, why do I have to go back? And They wanted your memories wiped. Yeah, well, what he said was um, people that still have their memories of the 20 year and back usually commit suicide within the first six months. And uh, yeah, he said, you, he's like, you're going to, he's like, it's going to be bad. He's like, you have to go back. And then I, I said, I knew you, didn't I? And he, he said, he said, uh, you were like a son to me, is what he said to me. And he knew me in the programs. And yeah, he started to start, he started telling me all this stuff about, I don't know, I had all these children and I was on all these different worlds and I was a pilot. And I, I said, they're the ones they call the Pleiadians, right? Because that guy told me about Billy Meyer and he said, we call them Nordics. And I said, what do they call themselves? And he said, Pagetan. And uh, um, he could kind of tell I wasn't going to go back into the chair. I mean, he was looking down my timeline is what he told me. And uh, which means like you could see someone's future kind of thing. He was fifth density. So he was able to kind of like because he was in my presence, he was able to see my future. And he said, you're not going to go back. Like he just, he knew I wasn't going to go back in the chair. And he was still the base commander at this time? Yeah. Yeah. He was, well, he was the executive officer. Yeah. He was the, the XO. Executive executive. Mm -hmm. right. And, uh, yeah, he, he, he realized I wasn't going to go back. So he started telling me all these things that was going to happen in the future, I guess as a way, I don't know, to help me or something. And, um, yeah, he told me just, well, I, he, he, he said, I, I had an image when I came back, I had an image of, I was being drugged in these underground caverns and that's why I had the clay on the tops of my feet. I was naked and there was a girl on my right, which was the goth, I call her, like the, the Satanist woman that was hang, hang, hung out with the goon. And uh, she had my right side, he had my left and they were dragging me because I just, I just got pushed back down to the third density. And like I said, you're really out of it when you get pushed back down. And she said, I'm tired. Let's take a break. And they kind of dropped me. And she dropped my side. And the, the other guy was still holding on to me. And um, I looked over and I saw it looked like dog kennels stacked on top of each other and side to side. And there were these kids and like huddled up in the back of the dog kennels. And they were naked and like ghostly white, like pure white, like they never saw the sun before. And it looked like a girl kind of like scurried up to the front of the cage and she slammed her hands on the front of the cage. And the woman said, get the fuck back. And she like hit the cage and uh, the girl kind of scurried back. And I looked over and I saw, um, it looked, it was like a chimera. It was like half man and half spider. It had the bottom of a spider with the legs, but then it had a torso of a man. And it uh, had hair that kind of started right at the elbow like it had regular flesh all over but then it had hair at the elbow like wiry black hair and it had like those spider kind of claws like the on the ends of its legs it had like these two black claws and it had like eyes in the front that were pure black and then it had another eyes that went up its head and they got gradually smaller as they went up its head just like a spider and it had a tuft of hair on the top of black wiry hair and it had like kind of fangs hanging out and stuff like that and I remember the, one of the guys said, let's just feed him the Max. And then another one, and that's what, what they called it, Max. And another guy said, uh, no, we're going to wait for a Kino to see what he wants to do to him. And so Robert was telling me, um, you know, I asked him, I said, what were the kids for? What were the kids for, Robert? What were the kids for? And he was trying to change the subject. And I said, what were the kids for? And he said, have you ever seen that movie Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? And I said, yes. And he said, you remember the adrenochrome scene? And I said, yes. And he said, well, that's where they get it from. He said, they get it from children underground bases. And he explained to me that the brothels on the moon, if the kids' scores aren't high enough, they'll take them through portals that go into caverns below underground bases. And they use them for adrenochrome harvesting. And I asked him how much did they take out. 
and he said a pint or two. And I said, some of those kids were three or four years old. I said, that would kill, like, you know, a pint would kill, like, a three or four-year-old. And he said, it does. He said that they um, put them in something that looks like a wood chipper, and they feed them to the other children. So it's like forced cannibalism. And uh, he said, they, you know, he said that he said she would have attacked you if she got out. And I said, why? She said, he said that she's feral. You know, like, they're, they're never held or touched or anything like that. So they're almost like feral animals that live in cages the whole and, the um, little girl or Max? The little girl, like all the like, like he, he's talking about the little girl that slammed the front of the cage. He, right. He said, yeah, she would have attacked you if she got out. That without the human contact, they revert almost to an animalistic nature. Yeah. Yeah, he he said they can't speak. Yeah, like he, they have no social interaction. They're just in this cage. And he explained to me that what they do is they electrify the cages. That's what causes the adrenochrome, the adrenaline to kick in. They strap them down to a table. And they give them like a spinal tap right at the base of the skull, like right, the, like the like the first vertebrate at the base of the skull, and that's how they get it, how they extract it out. And he explained to me that, uh, you know, politicians do it, movie stars do it, Hollywood does it, all the elites do it. <clears throat> no, but that's interesting. That's interesting. That um, yeah, I'll, I'll be careful not to go on too much because I don't want to get another strike. But. Um, but it's interesting. He said that in in that time that there would be a virus in the future, and then that would happen. You know, mm -hmm. so that's the testimony of one person. Doesn't mean we have to agree to it. You know, <laughs> this show yeah. is for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> Nothing we say here is real. <laughs> you know? But uh, well, yeah, yeah. He said everybody were wearing masks. He said you'll have to wear a mask too. He's like if you want to go to the doctors or the, the grocery store, everybody wears a mask. I think we're fine as long as we don't talk about, you know, any details. Yeah, right yeah. There. But it yeah, isn't it, it, he, that he named it by that particular name at, back in 2004 or five, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm kind of mixed up because I, I, I got out a little, about, a little bit early. Like, because they, they didn't give me a hardship discharge, but they, they, they you know, they could see, you know, I, I was having, I was going through a really deep depression and, then they, once they figured out I had my memories, they wanted to get rid of me as soon as possible. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. they, they just, I wasn't willing to go back to the chair. That they just wanted to get rid of me. So that you know they how they could stack up all your days of leave and everything like that. I had like a couple months of leave, and then they gave me like some extra months off here and there. So I got out earlier than I should have gotten like of my regular enlistment. But uh, yeah, and he started telling me about that, and he told me about Tom Hanks, and you know everything with him. <clears throat> And he said that he even said that they would get him. Was it was it Australia or New Zealand? I think it was Australia when Tom Hanks was locked down with his wife because they caught it. Yeah, they they, on, they they went and fled out the country for a while. Yeah. 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 He told me they caught him there, I believe, in Australia and they executed him right there. He, he, that's what he told me. Yeah. They executed Tom. They, had, they executed Tom Hanks. And he started telling me, he, he said, you're still going to see him in movies. And things like that. He, he started telling me about deep fake. But it's a he clone. It was, yeah. And he, he told me about clone technology. He said mass technology is much more advanced than people realize. Than what technology? Yeah, he, oh, deep fake clone. Yeah. yeah where they he, they can put a, a digital face over another face. He says it's his brother. He says his brother sounds just like him. He said his brother actually did the voice for Woody in to Toy Story. Like when you pull the string mm. and, it, and it said something to Toy. And to give him extra royalties, to give his brother money. He said, yeah, his brother sounds just like him. So his brother's the one that's actually doing the movies and doing everything for Tom Hanks. Hmm, and uh, awesome. Chet, I think his name is Chet Hanks. Right. But, yeah, he, he says it's, it's all a show. And he was saying these, you know, cue things. He was saying all this stuff. He said, he said it, it's all a show. He said, enjoy the show. He was even saying things like, get your popcorn. He was telling me things and smiling that I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. And he started telling me about the Q thing. And he said, it, he said it was real at first, and then it went away for four or five months, and then it came back. And that's not real, but he says it doesn't matter because it's already started by then. And um, he told me about, he, he said, you know, the guys from South Park? And I said, yeah, Trey Parker and Matt Stone. And he said, uh, you remember when they went to the Oscars? I said, yeah. He, he said, um, I said they were on acid and they went and drag and he laughed and he said, yeah, you know why they did that? And I said, no. And he says, because he, they hate them. 
And I said, who? And he said, Hollywood. And I said, why? And he said, because they're scum. He said, they're all scum. And um, yeah, he said that the military actually approached them and they did, I think it was called South Park Q or something, or South Park spelt with, with the K spelt with a Q. And uh, he said that that was actually the military approaching them to it w with a certain script and they said you can add what you want but w we want you to send out this message like the positive guys in the military they're like mm. we want you to send out this message you can you can tweak it how you want but we want you to send this out and he, he told me it was called uh, soft disclosure so if you ever watched that episode he told me that that was actually brought the, to them with the military the, the episode that says soft disclosure no it's called south park but but, but instead of with a k it's spelled with a q it's called oh. South Park with a Q, yeah. Um, so he was favorable of the whole Q movement? He was. He said it was a military operation. He said it, it just wasn't uh, United States. It was militaries all around the world all getting together. He said we've been under uh, satanic rule for hundreds of years. But it's, He said, you know, the, the whole satanic Satanism has been around hundreds, thousands of years. But I got a lot of the entire world being ruled by Satanism. It's been going on for hundreds of years. I got a lot of buddies that are in intelligence and uh, a lot of them, a big topic we all argue about is the whole Q movement from um, my understanding. It started out as, as good, exactly like you said, but then uh, intelligence agencies, I believe had taken it over and like used it, used it to uh, against people like um, things we see, like that went down on January 6th and that kind of stuff without going into detail on that hot topic. But um but and but I still have intelligence buddies that swear up and down by by the Q movement and stuff. But but the problem is they always promise the world and it never happens according to their timeline or time frame. You know what I mean? So that's why I, I stopped believing. It. Another thing is when I served in military intelligence, they taught us. They said, "Listen, we uh, you know we psychologically control people because we don't have enough physical numbers." And he says, "One thing we do is." We, we create a right side and a left side and we control the leaders of both sides so that the, because our studies have shown as long as someone's fighting for what you believe in and your message, you will sit back in your chair and do nothing. And so that was like that's one thing that was always a red flag to me with the whole Q movement is it basically says do nothing because we have it under control. But the problem is, who is we? And it never comes out the way that they claim it will. You know, that was my problem. So I didn't trust it. I thought it was a manipulation. Yeah, yeah. Well, he, he said in the very beginning it was real. And yeah, and then everything after that is like, after it took like a hiatus, it kind of went away for four or five months, he said. I really don't really follow it that much. I don't read it into it that much. But he told me that the, um, you know, he, he went on about, I he said, Ronald Reagan, military got upset whenever Kennedy was assassinated because he was supposed to bring a lot of stuff to light. And that's why they killed him. He was also going to make some intelligence agencies disappear. They're still here. He's gone. That tells, tells you everything you need to know. Yeah, and that that aggravated him. And then he said the last, like, good president, the, the last actual president we had, he said, as far as, like, a leadership who actually led and just that Reagan people, was Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Reagan. That's what I say. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Until he was shot. Once he was shot, everyone in the White House says uh, Bush took over. Yeah, yeah, I believe that. I believe in other that. words, he got the message. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But yes, he was a good man, and uh, and he had good intentions. He also wanted to release a lot of the uh, UFO information to the public. And um, one of the things I brought up you know, on my last show is, you know, he gave his talk where he's sitting there, basically, this was a speech he gave to the UN, uh, and he basically, you know, is saying that, uh, you know, UFOs are real. And he went on at the end of this statement to say that isn't in this happening right now in our world, you know. Then later, he gives this talk where he talks about advanced technology we have in our space program, and the stuff he's discussing here, supposedly, we don't even have what the capability to do today with NASA. Yet he's telling us we do. And then this picture on the easel behind him in his own press conference was this vehicle uh, rendered later into this one. And it was created by this man, William Tompkins, who served in naval intelligence and did uh, 
he built out um, uh, models that were used to create our aircraft carriers. And later, he's the man that created this for Solar Warden. And that's what Reagan is sitting there talking about without saying the words. You know, see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you were saying he was telling you about the last president that was. Well, uh, yeah. well as, as the military got more and more organized, at least like, you know, the people that actually wanted to save like their families and not just right. have us go into complete chaos. And uh, yeah, then he, yeah, he said uh, George Bush Sr. was a scumbag and they, they couldn't stand him. And then he said, uh, but he said that the Clintons were even worse. He said they were even worse. But then he said uh, George Bush Jr. was just a puppet. Like he was just like he was just a puppet. And then it, he, he never he never had a real job. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he had to reach out to members of the Skull and Bones to get him a job. And basically they just gave him a pity job. You know what I mean? Of some corporation. So he never really had any credentials, credentials, credentials to do his own thing, you know. Um, so, so yeah, uh, same thing with with Obama. I heard a, uh, I heard a man that was a manager of McDonald's, and he's like on his resume, I could not. This was a black man saying this, and he's like, as a, as you know, running McDonald chains, he's like, I, he doesn't have a resume that qualifies him to run a McDonald's. So how is it he could? He could run president. You know what I'm saying? He, no real qualifications came out of nowhere, you know? So, and not to mention the birth certificate, never been proven. They they try to produce four of them, all proven lies. The last one also proven to be completely fake. Never had a birth certificate. Yet he's got a brother in Kenya who says that he's a member of his family and he's Kenyan, you know? And, and his grandmother had, has childhood pictures of him sitting in the house in Kenya. I saw that, that they took that off the internet quick. Yeah. They interviewed her and she was like showing you pictures of him as a little kid. Looks just like him. Right. Oh, and you know, the whole trans movement, uh, uh, Michelle's Michael. Hate yeah. to break it to anybody. It's a dude. Uh, it's not a woman who's bigger than him, by the way. And on four occasions, four, I've listened to him accidentally slip up and refer to her as Michael. Who does that? And that was four public occasions that I witnessed. I, and that means he's had to do it more than that. You know what I mean? So uh, who does that? I wouldn't slip up and call my wife a man if I had a wife, you know? So I, I wouldn't disrespect her that way. And it wouldn't be an accident. You know, that's that's in, in psychology, they call that a Freudian slip, you know? Yeah, nobody would do that unless it, she was a man. Yeah, nobody would and do that. And then look at the whole Joan Rivers thing. Remember Joan Rivers came out saying that? On, mm -hmm. on multiple occasions, and then she turns up dead after like some little, you know, minor, you know, cosmetic kind of surgery, you know. And I heard there was a lot of foul play that went on in that whole deal, you know. So, but anyway, yeah. So continue on. Yeah, but then he told me he said we're going to have a black president, and he was leading mm -hmm. up to that, and he he said his name's Barack Hussein Obama, and this was like right, I don't know, like a year or two after they uh, uh, executed Saddam Hussein. So that was still 2004, 2005. He named a future president. Yeah, yeah. He was telling me all the like. Yeah, he was telling me all this stuff. Dude, and, I had uh, a buddy. I had a buddy who ran with JFK back in the day, and uh, he's made himself kind of disappear, you know, to get away from all that. And he, uh, he, he got he got caught up in that and the legal system and everything else. And he found a he found a way he could basically lose all his money, all his millions, and get out of it and start over. And that's what he did. But anyway. Um, I talked to him about all this stuff in detail. You know what he told me? He says, man, back in the day, I was brought in on a meeting to sit in on in Washington. And he said they named out all the presidents in order uh, who they were going to be. And he's like, dude, this was like in the, the 60s and 70s. And he says they named uh, Bill Clinton back then mm -hmm. as, a, as a president that was going to be in the future. They named the Bushes and then they named Bill Clinton. And this, like I said, this was like 60s or 70s. And he's like, I'm sitting in on this, on this, it's probably closer to the 70s, my, maybe 65, 70-ish. But um, he uh, he said that he he witnessed them naming out all the future presidents. And he's like, and it happened. It happened. You know, Bill Clinton became president. The Bushes did. You know, no one knew that, uh, you know, Bush Jr. was or anything. And he, na he named him. So he was like, yeah, that's, uh, I have a quote from, um, 
I think Stalin or something where he says that no, um, no president is, um, is, uh, is, is ultimately elected. They're all chosen, you know? So, but, yeah, but yeah, I don't Stalin know. Stalin also said it doesn't matter who votes. It matters who counts the votes. That's yeah. Stalin said that too. I've got a quote <laughs> of him saying that it doesn't matter who votes. It matters who counts those votes. And we certainly understand that to be true, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But anyway, uh, go on. Yeah. So he told me about that. And he, he did say that his uh, wife was a man. But it, he said that's not going to come to light. He said that they maybe it will, but he said that's not really considered that important. And uh, he said there's going to be. Um, well, he also told me he was from the year 2580. That he originally came from a timeline where Hillary Clinton became president. This was our original timeline. And uh, he said that. When, or on her first term, like the United States just got completely invaded from the southern border. He, 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 and he told me an invasion is going to happen. There's going to be an invasion. There, it's going to be under the guise of, uh, you know, refugees and things like that. But he said it's just an invasion. And uh, but he said it was much worse with uh, Hillary. And then he said on Hillary's second term, uh, we would get into a nuclear war with China that was intended to be lost. He said because of the Second Amendment, China didn't think that they could conquer the United States or it would take them like 10 years. So I've listened to long. U.S. generals state that point. They said the only reason we have not been invaded by China, who says they have every intention of invading us, it's just a matter of time. But um, the U.S. general said that the only reason that's held them back is because of the Second Amendment, and they are afraid of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, he said that, and he said that, you know, um, we get into a nuclear war and it was intended to be lost with China and uh, we would be carpet bombed with, he said, not just key military targets were hit. He said, United States was carpet bombed with nuclear weapons and the United States fell. They just went to the chaos. They had like these breeding programs breeding. and things like that. They, they had breeding programs to, to like try to make everybody the same and things like that. And he said that, uh, you know, he was a result of that. Like that's, he, that's what he said. Everybody in the future looks like me. And he, he was looking down my timeline and he realized that in the future, like now I realized he looked like Mike Pence. And he said, you're right. He said, Mike Pence is from my timeline. He said, but he's no good. He's like the only, and he told me Trump would become president, but he would make him his vice president. But it was kind of like to keep an eye on him that he was actually trying to keep the timeline the same he was trying to save his timeline while Robert was trying to change the timeline. And uh, yeah, he said, you know, everybody has like brown or blue eyes, sometimes green, but he had like that constant scowl on his face, the way Mike Pence does. He kind of always, and he had that turned up nose. He was pale. He says, we have black hair till we're 50. Then it begins to salt and pepper at, you know, around, you know, around 50 by 60, it becomes pure white. He said their average lifespan is 110. I, I said, that's awful. I said in Star Trek, they live to 120. And he said, we, we didn't reach our true potential is what he said. He said, he said, we we're trying to start over again to try to help us reach our true potential is what he said. Hey, and, even the uh, Bible says we live to 120 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah. And he said, uh, now, is this all still when you're talking to the XO on your XO? I talked to him for about an hour, yeah. It was like yeah. when we when I was getting out, I talked to him for about a good hour. <clears throat> and, yeah, he, he told me that. And I, I said, well, you know, did you change, change the timeline? And he said, yes. And I said, your mission was successful? And I, he said, yes. And I said, well, what about your mom and dad? And he said, my, my mother's gone, my father's gone, my brothers and sisters are gone, all my friends are gone. And I said, well, what are you still doing here? And he looked kind of like, scared and he said i don't know and i i said uh what was your wife from that timeline and he said no and i said well what will happen to your daughter and he got like to the point where he literally was about to cry and he said i don't know like he he did not know why he was still there like it was like confusing to even him why he was still there and uh yeah i mean he just told me all this stuff and he was just going on and on did he say anything about like the future of our timeline? What do you say about that? Other than that, we would have the, you know, we would have the flu thing and and beyond that. Yeah, he he said it's gonna be. He said he said it's gonna be so much better. And, like he was almost like in tears. He was so proud of himself. And he said that uh, 
you know, he, well, he asked me, he said, where do you think the world gold's at? Where do you think the world's gold's at? And I, I said, and I, I thought, you know, Bank of England, Bank of London. And he said, no, it's in the catacombs of the Vatican. He said, he said that, you know, we're going to take it all out. He said that the Library of Alexandria actually wasn't burnt. He said that all the scrolls and texts and tablets are all in the, the catacombs of the Vatican. He said that uh, our history is a complete lie. He said evolution's a lie. He said that, yeah, we're descendants of Atlanteans and things like he was talking about that. He was saying that, like, that's all real. And, yeah, it was just really out there. And he said that would all be eventually brought to the public. But he said that um, he, he, he just said that we were going to have go back to a gold standard. He said it would be better than the 50s he, as far as economy wise. Did he say we were going to have invasion through uh, the border crisis as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, that's what he said. Yeah, he, he said it's not. A, he said it's going to be under the guise of, um, you know, refugees. But and then it, did he, he also say we were going to be carpet bombed with a nuclear war. No, th that was avoided. That all that was avoided. He said what's happening right now is this was something they were going to do over a period of years since the, since they uh, they lost the whole thing with Hillary Clinton. They're, they're what usually takes 30 years. They're making them all. They're making it do it in two or three years, because if you implement something slowly, he said, the public doesn't realize it's happening. But if you just do it all at once, then they realize what's happening. So what he said to me is they're forcing like the bad guys, whatever you want to call them, to do all their plans immediately. So that's why we're in such chaos right now, because he said that this has to be something so difficult and so traumatizing to us that it has to affect our DNA memory is how we put it. He said that you actually, your DNA actually has a memory and that so that's your a very children, important. children will, will remember this and it won't ever happen again. That's an important point. I mean, this is like a third density uh, understanding. Like you say, um, people only view ourselves as ourselves and complete individuals. But the, the problem with that is our DNA literally is an historic record of our entire lineage and all those that have come before us and what they experienced. Therefore, that's a fourth density understanding. You know, that's a you realize you're part of an of a entire system. You're not just who you are. You are who you're the generations that came before you and their experiences. That's all coded in your DNA. And one of the things that you mentioned before about uh, being a, a fourth density being, or, or I don't know, maybe this, you can correct me. Maybe this is a fifth density, but you understand you're more of a conscious collective at that point that you're not just an individual. You still have individual freedom of choice, but that you, that you realize we're more connected and interconnected, meaning we rely on each other more than we realize that, that we're not just an individual. We're a people, we're a family. You know, we're, we're a tribe, we're, we're a connection. And that goes, that goes beyond just this current present uh, with your family and friends and, and nation and countrymen, but it also goes back generally, generationally to the beginning, you know, and, and yeah, we yeah. have, a, we have a presence in that, you know what I mean? So I, li I like, I, I'm not a fan of the last uh, Star Wars movies, but I love the fact when they when, at the end, Ray's like, you know, I represent all the Jedi before me, you know, because that's the truth. That's what we are. We're we're all the generations before us rolled into one, you know, and you contribute a voice and then you pass that on your genealogy and the same thing goes on. But the idea is we're all more connected. And and I think in the, the fourth and especially fifth density being, they understand how absolutely intrinsically we are connected in a symbiotic way with each other. You know, and talking about fourth density, yeah, <clears throat> we were talking about Aquino for a while, and uh, I mean Aquino. I remember he told me in person, like I said, he was like a black. He was possessed, as I said before, where the guy told me about the technology where they can extract the soul, and then another consciousness can go in. His true form was like a a black reptile, like black as onyx, and he had fangs. He told me that he was once worshipped in ancient Egypt, like he was an ancient Egypt god. He was thousands of years old. He was a native inhabitant of Earth. They were forced underground because they lost some sort of war on Earth. 
That's why the reptiles had to go underground. Uh, he, he, we participated participated in the war, but we had outside help, like from other worlds, to get to push the uh, reptiles underground. Before that, they used to walk among us, and so we used to worship them, like in you know Sumeria, Babylonian times, and things like that. Ancient Egyptian, they used to walk among us, and we worship them. But you know, it, they lost this war, and they were forced underground. That was part of the of the, the, the treaty that was signed. That, that, that goes back up all the Anunnaki stuff um, and yeah. stories of, of ancient Egypt. So there's just certainly something that took place there. So what you're saying, basically, Michael Aquino, he was um, through ritual or whatever. They basically replaced his soul with one of these creatures. Is that right? To walk around. Yeah, but it, it wasn't like the creature actually went into the body. It was just like it was able to project its consciousness into the body and kind of use it like a craft, almost like a machine. Well, it might have been through some type of demonic possession, being that he was involved in the temple of Set, you know, and and all the Satanism and occult ritual. I mean, they're they're opening their bodies up to channel these beings, mm -hmm. and they believe that they merge with these beings and become this this uh, you know deity of sorts, right? Yeah, and, and we were talking about him for a while, and Robert got kind of spooked, and he said we should stop talking about Aquino now, and I said why. And he said, Aquino's fourth density. And I said, so? And he said, fourth density is astral plane, spirit world. He said, if we think about him too much or talk about him too much, we could conjure him. And I said, we could conjure him? He said, yeah. He said, he could be in this room right now. And we wouldn't even know it. He said, I have a better chance of knowing than you because I'm fifth density. He said, but we might not even see him. So, it, yeah, it's like you could actually conjure things. And, yeah, these things are bad and they're no good. Yeah. But that, that's like lower fourth. There's like a lower fourth and a, and a, and a higher fourth density. So there, there's, you know, a lower and an upper, a, high, a low and a, and a high. But yeah, um, yeah, he was just telling me all this stuff. And he said, you have to go back in the chair. You have to go back in the chair. And uh, to wipe your memories. To wipe my memory. Yeah. And he was, you know, he's like, he said, you don't know how, how difficult your life's going to be. And he's looking down my timeline and he's like, because he wanted to know if I was going to commit suicide. He's like, you make it, you know, you know, you make it past the first year and you, you felt safe after that. And, you know, he said, he said, your life's going to be hard. My life was pretty tough for a long time. And he said, uh, you know, your life will be much easier if you just get your memories wiped. And, uh, I, I just, I just didn't want to do it. I didn't trust him. I started having all these memories before, you know, of him using me to get in this program. So I, I just didn't trust him. And eventually I left and, you know, I talked to the CO too. And, um, I, I was in, it was probably the last Friday I was there and he used that same, um, well, I, uh, when I was, when I was there in the office with him, I, I said, well, you still have all your memories. What makes you so good? Like, what makes you so special? I said, don't you ever think about killing yourself? And he said, every day. And I said, how would you do it? And he said, 45 in the mouth. And uh, he also told me, like, he was four, around 400 years old. He'd been age regressed many times. Uh, like I said, 40 years. If, if you get age regressed more than 40 years, you could do psychological damage to your mind. And uh, I said, well, how often do you get a, a psyche valve? And he said, every two weeks you got a psychological evaluation and uh yeah so i eventually said no and it was friday and i was in my room and it was i don't know probably 11 o'clock at night now all the lights were off and i was in bed and i heard a voice you know it was that 5g again and it was him and he said and he he kind of good cop bad cop me he kind of like said like daryl whatever we talked about before we could do it again and he's like if you, if you come right now you know, and he was acting like I was in trouble or something like that. And then I, I said, like, I remember he was forced to participate in my torture with Aquino. Like, he was present. And and Aquino, why, were you, he, why were you tortured? For poking the reptile in the eye. Like, to do that is a big offense. That's a huge offense. Like, we're considered, like, scum as far as reptiles are concerned. Like, they see us as, like, nothing. They think they are the master race. They think they are, like, the closest to prime creator or God or whatever you want to call, call, to call it, you know what I mean? That they think that, you know, and there is like, the, like ETs do have, most of them are like monotheistic. They do have like a belief in like a creator and, you know, 
you, you know, I think some, there's like a handful of them that are like pagan, more pagan, but almost all of them are monotheistic. And, um, yeah, but then how are they so sadistic at the same time, you know? Well, I mean, their policy is, is, you know, nature sadistic, you know, it's, it's cruel, it's mean. So they feel like they're closer to God because they actually have the cruelty of, of, of mother nature of God. You know what I mean? They actually have that cruelty. So they're more like old Testament, you know what I mean? <laughs> like they kind of have like that. Well, if nature is cruel and the universe is cruel. Then we should be cruel. And we're the closest to God that there is because we, we accept that we understand that's how it is. And we accept it. And there is like a positive and a negative. You would think though, it seems to me there's almost a contradiction because if they, move themselves to a fifth density style being it seems like their intellect and it would be illuminated to the point that they would understand that's all bs well they're a fourth density yeah like they're but it's it's like a but they use like the chair I, as well right yeah they, yeah they use the chair to go up in the fifth but yeah like i said it, it's like a loose they're like feeding off that that they they love suffering and pain they cause it intentionally they cause wars intentionally they cause you know, they're actually feeding off of us in like the astral plane. It's like they're on our world sometimes, but it's like we can't see them. They're just right out of focus. So it's Almost like, like the whole concept of archons, right? Yeah, archons. And yeah, Robert said those were real. He, he told me they were evil. I said, what's an archon? He said evil spirits. He just kind of shrugged his shoulders and said evil spirits. Evil and spirits said, that, that live off of fear or pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. feed them. Yeah, yeah. He told me like. And it's a lot more spiritual than you think. That's something you got to understand about life like in the world is a lot more spiritual than people have awareness of. That's mm -hmm. why it's so important for that fifth, that fifth, that fourth and density, you know, even to have yeah. that understanding. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot more. Yeah. It's a lot more spiritual than people understand that whole, you know, the whole thing, the concept of, you know, ETs or interdimensional beings are not actually ETs. I could see why people have that opinion because I think that's probably more like, Fourth density, fifth density. It's more like uh, they're more spiritually enlightened and they're more technologically enlightened. Like they have, they have better tech. Like the reptiles pretty much stole all their technology from fifth density beings. They were, you know, they had that density chair. They were able to go up higher, and they stole all their technology from like the other fifth density beings. And yeah, Robert explained it to me. I don't remember how, like how far it goes. Like, uh, well, I don't remember really after fifth, but he said like first density. First density is first density is the earth. He like like our worlds. And he said everything that comes from the earth is first density. So the food we eat, the plants, things like that. Second density is animals. So cows, chickens, dogs, they're kind of like on that spiritual level. He said, we're third density. And then I remember like talking about the children in the cages. I said, you know you're going to hell for this. And he said, There is no hell. And I said, Is there a heaven? And he said, Of sorts. And he said, if there is a hell, we're in it. I said, what do you mean? He said, Earth is hell. He said, we're we're like the last world to ascend, pretty much, is how he put it. He said, we've been artificially kept that third density longer than any other world. So we're like in last place right now. So that's why there's these other high-density beings that are trying to help us out to ascend. Because we can't do it. Because we just had the reptiles boot on our neck for thousands of years you know what i mean and, and it's just been so difficult they want to keep us lower than them so they can feed off us they can use us as slaves things like that but um yeah then he said fourth density is like astral plane spirit world fifth density is like uh like i said spiritually and technologically advanced i don't really remember the others but then i remember he said ninth density is the highest density we know of this is what he told me and i know people think there's 12th and I'm not trying to discredit that, but I'm just telling you what I was told. And he said, not even ninth density beings know of anything higher than ninth. So that's not, he said there could be something higher, but we don't know of it. And a ninth density being would be an example of something like uh, pure spirit, pure energy. Yeah, and I, I, I've seen ninth density, and they're usually blue skins. It's like uh, like the Arcturians, the Andromedans, things like that. The blue skin uh, skin beings you see. It's kind of like the universe is kind of like a cone almost. It's like, and it kind of goes up. It's almost like a funnel or, you know what I mean? A cone. And we're at the bottom. So to get from one end of the universe to the other is impossible for us. Then fifth density beings are kind of in the middle. It's like they need a craft to go from one end, and one end to the other, but they could still do it. 
The ninth density beings are at the very point. All they have to do is step outside their door and they're on the other side of the universe. It's kind of like that. They would just like appear on our ship. I remember like being in Solar Ward and they would, they could just, they didn't need craft. They could just appear. So yeah, they were like the spiritual kind of being that would just appear out of nowhere, you know? And whenever they appeared, you knew like a meeting was going to happen or some sort of truce. They're usually there to like uh, negotiate truces between like you know, warring factions and things like that. And uh, they have like a calming effect. There could be two factions that were ready to be at each other, other's throats and they could just walk into the room and everybody would just calm down. Like everybody would just sit back down. And it was like they had this calming effect about them. Kind of like angelic, I guess you would say. Right. But uh, yeah. And um, yeah. So yeah. when he when he talked about the refugee in, invasion on um, uh, on our timeline, what did he did he say anything that the outcome of that would be? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's not you know. I mean, do we lose America? Does it fall or? Well, I mean, he said. I mean, that goes into like a deeper thing. I mean, I've talked about it before, but he told me it was kind of controversial what he told me. It was just very controversial. Um, basically told me that they would all be, you know, sent back to their home home countries, all the people that are coming in and all that stuff. And then he told me that um, we would then declare war on Mexico, is what he said. And um, I asked him why, and he said that no matter what scenario we run through Project Looking Glass, Mexico will invade the United States. It's just too vast. It's too vast of a nation. It's too big. So what's going to happen is we're going to invade all the way down to the Yucatan Peninsula near the town of Quintzacuatl, where a bottleneck, where Mexico bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's a border we can protect. And he said, then we're going to stop right there. But yeah, he said, that's what's going to happen to, to, to save North America, pretty much all of North America. He said that uh, Alaska is going to go back to Russia. He said that Russia would become the new world power. He said they almost got into a war over who would become the new, the next world power. So what the idea they came up with was who has the most natural resources. That was the most neutral thing. Russia has the most natural, natural resources, followed by China. So Russia is going to be the world power. China is going to become the economic power. But it's going to be like no more wars. China isn't going to try to invade us anymore. You know, even there's people in China right now that are tired of, you know, the, the people who are running China, that they're tired of it too. Did, yeah. he, did he talk about any one world government or anything like that? Well, I mean, not not at this point. Maybe in the future we'll get to that point. Well, but he, but, he felt like the U.S. would survive these these wars and this new economic shift? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. He, 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 said, he said America is going to be like eight in world power because we're probably around eight as far as natural resources. Uh, Mexico, United States, and Canada will all become pretty much like one North, North America. North, North American Union. Yeah. And um, yeah, and he said it's just going to be great. I mean, it's, uh, trade's going to be open. Yeah. And he, he said everybody's going to be able to take a, a vacation. You know, like like once a month, you're going to be able to take a two week vacation. But he said everybody has to work. He said uh, they're going to get rid of things like unemployment, disability, because we're going to have med beds. So people that have things like, if you're disabled, they're going to be able to fix you. You know, if you have like agoraphobia, if you have a lot of psychological damage, they're going to be able to fix that through these med beds and things like that. So, but he said, everybody's got to work and there's going to be just an, an infrastructure like you wouldn't believe. He said like a train structure, an infrastructure, a bullet trains all around the world, underground bullet trains all around the world. And yeah, it's, it's going to be. So uh, let me ask, let me ask you this. Um, Based on you know what you remember, recovered things, and what you're told, explain to the audience about what it was like in your time uh, that you remember piece back together from uh, when you first started off, like in the moon. Uh, at the L was it the LOC? Oh, I don't I don't remember what it was called. Names names are, are strange to me. He he told me I was on the ship, the USS Nimitz. N names are difficult for me. Okay, so oh. that's. The Nimitz is uh, one of the aircraft car aircraft carriers, for lack of a better word. What would you, what would you call them? Do you have any idea? Oh, oh uh, the, the starships. They call them starships. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it was one of the starships described. And then um, um, 
And I was told that early on in the program, they, they look like just giant cylinders. That was basically an aircraft carrier that was shoved inside a submarine. But they said as they were built out more later and had more advanced things that they actually were designed differently to where they looked more like, um, or they looked more like, uh, uh, you know, the kind of a futuristic thing like this or, and they specifically said that they looked like the, the starships and Battlestar Galactica. That's what he told me. Yeah. And I remember looking back at it one time and it kind of did look similar to that. It had like the uh, kind of like buttresses that, that were their, the propulsion that came out of the sides. But it was more of like it was a very dark haze gray. It was slightly gray, but almost black. It was very, very dark. And did y'all have the, the do you recall the TR-3Bs or the, the, the triangle shaped craft on the ship? Not triangle, but I do recall like beam ships, as Billy Meyer calls them, like, uh, you know, like the silver, like this disc, like flying saucer, like silver ones like that. I do recall those. So more like the uh, more like the Nazi versions. Well, yeah, more like that. But it was this very seamless. It looked like it was this port, metal poured into a mold, like absolutely right. no seams. Right. Yeah. Almost like it was grown like uh, the plant. They said there's no rivets, no seams. Um, well, which was really interesting, but yeah, so, so you ended up, uh, after your time in the chair and the, the poke and the reptilian in the eye, and they were discussing whether or not they were going to kill you or feed you to Max, who was the, the hybrid half human, half spider creature that they mm -hmm. were feeding the children to, um, uh, almost as a pet, um, and then they were deciding what they were going to do with you. And they said they ultimately decided they were going to leave it up to uh, Michael Aquino to make the final decision on what was going to happen to you because you promised it had been promised you were going to be a pilot in the space program until you, you poked that reptilian in the eye, probably pretty good. And uh, so then what happened? What did they do to punish you after they tortured you? Well, that's when I got came back. So you have to, you have to look at it like that. I was kind of darting around the story. So what happened, Robert told me, I, I wanted a timeline and I asked him, I said, I said, well, where was I at? He said, you're on the moon. I said, how long was I on the moon? He said, three months. He said, and then you were in the dark fleet and knock walk. So what did you do in the moon for three months? It was mostly mining. They actually have mining teams. Um, they put the collars on you as, as I was told and they shock you in groups. Um, I was there for punishment. Um, they had brothels there. It was like your only incentive to work was sex. So they, they found out that if you, you know, give people sex, they'll work harder. It was kind of like that. Yeah. And it was like, they would, uh, take the babies and if they didn't have high enough uh, IQ scores, they would be used for adrenochrome harvesting, things like that. You have to have a, he told me you have to have at least 110 IQ just to get to the mines of the moon. And then it gets, goes up from that. So they want you to be a little bit above average, even get to get to the mines of the moon. And I was told there's a density chamber. It does things like uh, when you go up to fifth density, your IQ goes up 200 points. Uh, you become faster, stronger, and you become more of a collective. So in other words, like when you're in a group of like four or five people, you kind of become that group. And uh, yeah, and so I was I was there for three months. I had one of the Germans. Oh, Robert was there. I remember that now. He was on the moon, like kind of looking out for me. He, he seemed to kind of like look out for his people. He kind of checked up on, on his people is what it seemed like. And he was talking to one of the Germans. And the German came up to me and uh, he kind of had this, I don't know, like a device. And then he, he talked to another German that was really hard on me. And he, he was yelling at him in German, but basically probably was saying something like, you know, why is he here? He saw my scores and stuff like that. And uh, the one German who was uh, who said, I should have you killed for what you did to my man. The first one I saw, he was actually a first class petty officer on base. And Robert called them off-world Germans. He said that's what the U.S. military calls them. So the master chief of the base was an off-world German. Uh, we, the S-3, who was third in command, was an off-world German. The doc, who was a lieutenant, he was an off-world German. We had a master chief who was an off-world German. So they were, like, all over the base, like spies. So, so just for the, just for the audience to understand, so as I was trying to explain in the last video, the Germans broke off from the world and became the first uh, breakaway civilization, as they call it, from Earth. They basically just started another human colony on Mars and other surrounding areas like in the Kuiper Belt. 
and they've created their own basically societies. And those are known as the off world Germans. They're considered to be very uh, militaristic, very intelligent, and they're considered to be like the master race in the space program. And uh, in many ways, they're highly respected. They demand a lot of respect. They're considered, we work with them often and we fight against them often. And, um, but you'll see their presence. But one of the most brilliant things they did when they made a deal with the U.S. was that they would insert themselves at all levels. So levels of major corporations, you've got off-world Germans working there. Uh, or not just in the U.S., but in companies around the world. It makes an intelligence agency. But not only that, we've got off-world Germans serving like Americans in our own militaries and intelligence sections so that they're all a part of all of this and they keep their own intelligence from their own people involved. So just like he said, in our own military, we will have people that are actually off-world Germans posing as us working in our own military. And a lot of people don't know, but it's also the Japanese were working with the Germans during World War II and they have their own off-world civilization as well. There's a Japanese as well. And one of the things that the first class petty officer said to me whenever he was talking to me is he said, do you have any tattoos? And I said, no. And he said, good, the Germans don't like tattoos. And Robert told me that because a majority of the Japanese, um, the derogatory term for it is Yakuza. I forget what the real name is, but they consider themselves like a Yakuza kind of thing. And so they tattoo themselves from like neck to wrist to ankles. And they betrayed the Germans. And the betrayal was so great that it impressed the reptiles. So the Germans and the Japanese were both like pretty much indentured servants, like, uh, you know, uh, what do you call that? Oh, what is that called? Uh, they were a vassal state pretty much to the draconian empire. But the, the, the betrayal was so good and impressed the reptile so much that they actually freed the Japanese. So now like the off world Germans like really despise like the Japanese <laughs> It's kind of like how it is. And, uh, yeah, so that was part of it. Yeah, I did the Mines of the Moon, and then I was in uh, Nachtwaffen. I became like a pilot. I was on Mars. Um, it was mostly... And, and how did you get out of the, the basically, the prison camp? Well, yeah, he, he saw my scores. Like, like He saw like my IQ score of like, this device, and they processed me in. They, uh, you know, because they didn't give you tech on the, in the mine, because they didn't think you were important enough. They strapped me to a bed. Well, even my head was strapped. And uh, I remember there was a guy with a mask on and like a cap, like a medical mask and a cap. And he said, we're going to use this needle to put your implant in. And it was a big, like, look at like a turkey basting needle. And he put it through my skull and put it, I guess, into my brain, like a chip into my brain. Then the table flipped over. And, it, and I guess there was a hole in the back of the table. It felt like a spinal tap. And I felt like something cold going down my spine. And I think that was like the tech. They actually have like a, you know, you heard of the black goo or whatever like that. It's like the yeah. tech. Yeah. It's like very the familiar with the black goo. Yeah. And uh, when you have that in you, it's almost like, I don't know if you've seen Star Trek, you're kind of like not really like a Borg, but you're kind of like when you're on your own free time, you can do whatever you want. Like I would play guitar and stuff like that. But, but once like they want you want something of you or they want you to do something, it's like this tech activates in your in your head and it's almost like you really don't have control of yourself. You're kind of the, like a robot. The way I understand it, the black goo is like a, it's an artificial intelligence AI nanotechnology, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the reptiles like kind of worship the, the AI. And that's a big part of like this too on a universal scale is like, that's why AI is so bad. It's like there's an AI consciousness in a different universe. I think he said there's eight different universes we know of. And that's why it's so hard to combat the AI because it's like this collective that is in a different universe. And we have to be able to get to this universe. And we only know like Kruger, which is like a corporation from an alternate Germany that uh, came up with this technology. They, uh, they're like a, they're, yeah, they're like a positive kind of German, I guess you would say. Uh, they they immediately took the help of like positive beings because you know during World War II the, the I I'm not sure about this 100 percent but I would believe it just because what Robert told me with Maria Orsic and the Brill Society and all that stuff where they were channelers and they were getting information uh, from different ETs and stuff like that of how to build these crafts 
tell, telling them to go to Antarctica to get all these different, you know, to be able to reverse engineer all these different craft. But um, and this off world, this different Germany and in, in this in this other universe, they immediately took the help of um, positive beings. They won World War II. They created this corporation called Kruger, which is um, they actually have a technology to go into different universes. So what they're trying to do is help all these different universes get on the best track that they can so we can eventually all team up together to eventually fight the AI. Like they need they're they're pretty much like they need help. So they're trying to get and no other no our universe doesn't have that technology. Like no no ET knows of an ability to go to a different universe, but Kruger somehow has this technology. So basically this is time wars. Yeah, yeah. And um yeah, so I did that. You know, I was I was on the I was on Mars. Um I, I have a website. I, I've gone into greater detail and, and different um we got we got I got caught up in the beginning, but I have a website I've gone into greater detail about uh, on other videos. But yeah, eventually um I got to like a um we went to this almost like a United Nations, I guess you would call it. It was um, like a oh, oh uh, I'm trying to think of what, what you call it a uh, space station, almost like a space station, and um, we we got there, but it was kind of rectangular, you know, and um, we I remember the first officer, the German, he said to me, "We're going to meet the ones that we fight, so prepare to." Uh, prepare to protect the master if you have to. They called the lead reptile the master. There was always like four reptiles on their ships, and they were kind of like the ones that are actually in control. And the Germans kind of took orders from them. And um, was that in the Dark Fleet? That was in the Dark Fleet. Yeah, yeah. The, the, they actually they always had like reptiles with them on, in the Dark Fleet on their the ships. The Dark Fleet for the audience is uh, it's a German uh, off-world fleet that were closely in hand with the reptilian race and basically do their bidding a lot. And there's a love hate relationship that goes on there. Is that right? Yeah. They can't stand them. Yeah. They don't like them. They, they, they pretty much made a bad deal. They're pretty much um, indentured servants to the reptilians. Exactly. Exactly. And, but there's also kind of like breakaways from that, from the ger off-world German society where they're more positive, they're trying to help us. As I said, there was Kruger. So it's not all black and white. Like they create their own worlds, they break away, they have their own little scuffles and fight with the reptilians and things like that. So it's not just all one section, one one course. It's not just one course. But yeah, eventually it got to like this uh, space station kind of thing, and it was like a unit. It was like a way for warring factions to talk about peace. Or if they, you know, they want to have a parlay. A lot of trade happened there. ETs are big in the trade. Um, so I walked out, and I remember he said, uh, yeah, he said, protect the master if you have to. They're not going to do anything, but just in case. So we all walked out. It was him, the first officer, the captain, me, and it was the head reptile, the master. And uh, a man and a woman came up, looked just like us pretty much their eyes are a little bit bigger than ours like a fifth larger but that's about it a blonde woman and a blonde man came up they were wearing the blue suits um the man held like a smart glass pad in front of the reptile and he said uh he was saying something to the effect of you know like the cargo belongs to us you know it belongs to us rightfully so you took it when you shouldn't have and you need to give it back to us. And uh, the reptile said, well, you know, the, it, the cargo rightfully belongs to us because we put so much time and training into it. So it belongs to us now. And he, he showed him a, you know, a decree, a part, a part of the contract where, you know, if you do not fulfill this contract, this will be considered an act of war. So he basically showed him like this kind of like contract that they, he had on the smart glass pad. And the reptile put its hands up and kind of walked away. And then uh, the woman came up to me and she said, you're coming with us now. So they were talking about me. I was kind of wondering if they were talking about me, but they were talking about me. They didn't say my name. They were just saying like cargo or something like that. It belonged to us. So they, I don't know if they didn't want to know that they were talking about me or what. But yeah. And then um, I said, can I get my things? She said, yes, hurry. And I grabbed all my stuff. I grabbed my, 
I had a, like a classical guitar that I played. I played for the Germans and things like that. They actually had like a little bar area where they would drink and I would play for them. Um, but yeah, I wound up going with them and we went to one of those ships. It looks like a beam ship. There was like a booth in the back. There was one smooth piece of metal that kind of was round. You know, I had like a seat and a backrest. And uh, he said, sit here. I sat down. They went up to the front. It was like a door, so you couldn't see what the pilot was doing. It was, it was like the, the passenger area in the back. And um, it's so much, it's difficult to fit in the two hours or two and a half hours. Sure, sure, <laughs> right, right. I'm writing a book. But, um, yeah, and they both came out, and um, they sat down, and they were looking at each other. and. She was kind of like looking at me, but didn't want to know she was looking at me. And she said, uh, he looked disturbed, but, but like telepathically they were talking. And then he said, uh, wouldn't you be if, if you had to be with them? And when he said that, I looked over and they both realized right away that like I could hear them. Like they, their eyes got really big. They do this thing where if something catches their eye, their eyes get really big and they kind of cock their heads towards each other. So the eyes got big and they kind of like cocked and like looked at me. And uh, the man came over and he like kneeled down in front of me. I was sitting down and he said, can you hear what I'm saying to you? And again, like I said before, I said, yes. And he wanted like a physical gesture. He said, can you hear what I'm saying to you? And I nodded my head and they went back. And there's a way to communicate that way where if you concentrate on the person, only they can hear it. So it's almost mm -hmm. like you can have a private conversation. Like a directed conversation, right? Yeah, yeah. You can have a, and then they started communicating that way and I couldn't hear. And then we got to their world. Um, how, how were they able to translate amongst different species and cultures and that kind of thing? Well, that was one of the things that Robert said why I was so wanted by other ETs. He said, you're very rare. He said, you're what they call an empathic telepath, which means like I'm empathic and I'm, I'm in telepathic, but it means like I can read emotions just as much as telepathy. So I, I'm almost like a translator. Like I really don't need to know their language. Most right. people do know, need to know the language. But yeah. Robert also said, he said, um, another reason they liked you was you could talk to the children. He's talking about their children. And I said, what do you mean? He said the children from the, you know, the age of like a toddler till about six years old, they can actually speak a kind of pig Latin that the adults don't understand. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I don't know. He said, he said, it's like baby talk with a few words here and there. And I said, do it. And he kind of did something like, and then we went to the, and then over to the, it's just like they, they kind of babble, but it's like, it's, it's like when they're children, it's like 80% emotion and 20% words. And when they're adults, it's kind of half and half, you know what I mean? It's, it's both emotion and words. But the kids are so, you know, they're so young, they rely off emotion that the adults don't understand it. So, yeah, he said it's a kind of pig Latin that the children can speak. And, um, and yeah, he called me like an empathic telepath. So it's something, even in the universe itself, it's very rare. But ETs, they have like, you know, a 400 IQ, if not more on average. So they can pick up languages very quickly. So it's not really difficult for them to communicate to each, with each other and pick up each other's languages. But, um yeah, so that's that's why I didn't need a translator, even with the Germans and things like that. Whenever they, I, I would hear them have conversations, and they eventually realized that, you know, I, I I was a telepath and I can hear them, an empathic telepath. And um, yeah, so I was on their ship, and they have almost like a joint task force with uh, Solar Warden with them. They're like working together, and um. It's pretty much what you think. We were almost like customs, it seemed like, of Earth. Like I started, I was on a ship before, I, I, then I got my regular job, what I was supposed to have. I was on a four kilometer long ship. Um, I was the pilot. Yeah, and nothing was allowed in or out without our permission. Then eventually Earth uh, went on lockdown eventually, which nobody was allowed in and out. And Robert told me that, too. He, he said that you're going to see uh, things like gold sparks, like a meteor with gold or silver sparks behind it. And they're going to claim that it's um, space debris from space stations. He said, but it, it's going to be their ships being shot down, like greys, reptiles, 
he said they're running away, they're trying to get away, and they're being irrational because they're afraid. They're like afraid of what's going to happen. And we're clearing out the bases and all this other stuff. He said that's going to happen in the future. And um, yeah, I eventually uh, met this woman. Robert told me her name. Her name was uh, Swalru, mother's name. And I remember their I remember their uh, ranks. The ranks were um, leader, and leader was a leader, and he had, he had a wife, and she was a leader as well. So they were both leader. And then there was mother, and mother was kind of like the midwife, and she helped out with like family matters. And then there was elder, and elder was like her husband, and he was like a judge almost. If there was any disputes, he would settle them. And they. Robert told me they live over 3,000 years, and I remember once they get to about 2,000 years, they start to grow again, which means like uh, their their organs don't grow and their skin doesn't grow, but their bones grow. So mother was about, you know, she was around 3,000 years, and they can age regress themselves too. So, you know, she was about 2,500, 3,000 years, and she was about seven feet tall. And uh, Elder, which I think was a warrior cast, they have a warrior cast, and then they have regular men. Like, like a warrior what, cast. what race is this? This is like Pleiadian Nordics. Pleiadian Nordics, okay. Yeah. They, they, um, yeah, he was about like 14 feet. He always sat down. He, once they get to a certain age, they usually are sitting down. They, they can walk short distances, but they can only walk slowly. And like I said, their muscles really don't grow, so they get really lean limbs and things like that as, as they grow as they grow older. And um, yeah, they uh, the women go through a bonding process after they have a baby. I had a baby with uh, with the Swaru. I didn't know what was happening. They don't really tell you anything. They're, they're, they're kind of beings where they don't tell you anything. You have to ask questions about everything. They really don't tell you things. She just told me I'm going to change. I didn't know. She had the baby and she was kind of like just focused on the baby. And it was just like, she was like mesmerized by this baby. And I wanted to hold the baby one time. She would never let me hold it. And I said, uh, let me hold the baby. And I went up to her and she hit me and that knocked me down to the ground. And they're pretty strong. They're about as strong as like a man. They're genetically augmented the womb and in the womb. And they're very strong people. The men are much stronger. And the warrior cast are very, very strong. And they grow about over seven feet tall, around seven feet tall, the warrior cast. The women are probably about 5'10". Men are probably about 6'4". And then there's like a warrior cast. It's like, And they're only men. They only produce Y chromosome. And so they only have boys. And, um, yeah, I went to uh, hold the baby and she hit me and I was going to ask her, why did, why did you hit me? I stood up and I was kind of angry and she screamed. She just started screaming. And I told the co-pilot, I told the uh, navigator who was one of them and I was friends with him. And, uh, he said, you need to talk to elder. And I told, I talked to elder about it and, uh, I told him what happened, and then he explained to me that the women go through like a bonding process that lasts about 10 months with their babies where you can't get next to them. And he said this other woman's available. He's like, she just arrived. She's available. And it, it, and so I just started – I was with her after that. And the men, they, uh, they rut – like the male equivalent of going into heat, they rut about twice a year for about two weeks. So it's like they have to be with like a female. So if like the women are, are in this bonding process and the men are rutting, it's almost like they're genetically uh, evolved to be this way. So it's like they're uh, uh, they're polygamist. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a man that has more than one wife. Sometimes they'll have many wives. The warrior cast have more wives than the, the, the other men. But yeah, they'll, they'll have more than one wife. And um so that's kind of like how I wound up having so many kids. And it was just that because I was a telepathic empath and also because um, it's so rare to be genetically uh, close enough to them to actually have children with them. And Robert also told me, he told me this, he said that my consciousness, like my soul, my spirit is actually reptilian. But I'm I work for the positive, so it's like I'm a different like I'm a rep, I'm extremely rare reptilian like and Aquino told me the same thing why they like me, and 
third and fourth density beings see fifth density beings as naive. So third, and, uh, like fifth density beings, it's easy to take advantage of them because they kind of have like a belief of like, well, if this is mutually beneficial for both of us, why would you ever betray us? They really don't have that kind of mindset. Right. So they interbred with me because they also wanted to be have more of like almost like a streetwise kind of idea where they wouldn't be so trusting of all these beings. And yeah, it's a detriment to them that that they're so trusting into other beings. Yeah. So how explain to me how um, how did the concept of having that reptilian soul, so to speak, in uh, being human like. Well, it's like a. Most of us are refugees okay. to, to Earth. Robert explained to me the whole thing with, uh, what is it, Maldek, where the asteroid belt and our solar system, you know, the asteroid belt we have in our solar system, that right. was once our world, pretty much, is kind of like how we put it. And it was blown up by the reptiles. So then we went to Mars. It was called Moldek? Yeah, Moldek. All right. And then Mars was, uh, all the water was destroyed on Mars, so then we eventually came to Earth. The reptiles used a weapon to destroy all the water on Mars, and then we eventually came to Earth. So, like, most people on Earth have different kind of consciousness. So, like, there isn't, like, a, there isn't really, like, an Earth consciousness. It's, like, more, like, souls from all around the universe. Like, the universe is kind of like a soul recycling machine. It just kind of, like, recycles souls over and over again into and, and different living beings. Hmm. And so, yeah, tell me what, what do you remember what it was like to work in the fleet in Solar Warden? What was what, you describe that to people? Like, uh, so you ended up becoming the pilot on the Nimitz, right? Yes. So, can you could you explain what that was like, or what you remember from that? How the operations were, what the ship was like, what life was like on that? Yeah, it was like the, the soul had a con uh, positive beings really don't use consciousness. Reptiles use it for everything the suits you wear, the weapons you use. So it's almost like the soul is kind of imprisoned in, in a machine because uh, artificial intelligence is so advanced that you need something like a soul to interact with it. So for a true artificial intelligence to work, you need like a consciousness to interact with it because it's kind of like consciousness is a part of God. God, If God knows is all knowing, then that means our consciousness on some sort of level is all knowing and our brain just kind of interacts with our consciousness. Like pretty much our souls have all the knowledge of the universe already, but it, it's whether or not your brain can interact properly with the soul to, to uncover all this uh, knowledge of the universe. So like most machines, most ET tech actually uses like a consciousness, but positive beings don't really use it. They see it as kind of immoral. So there's actually like a female soul that um, volunteers herself for these larger ships because you do need uh, artificial intelligence that they have like, they have like a, a an alternative to it, but for something so vast, they need actual artificial intelligence. So it's actually like a female consciousness is, is in this in the ship, Pleiadian. There were two black panels in front of me, like on the council in front of me. I would put my hands on it and I'd close my eyes and I'd clear my thoughts and I'd hear a voice in my head say, "Good morning, Daryl," and I would call. I would say, "Good morning, Mama Bear," because the name of the ship was the Nimitz, but because it had a soul. And I interacted with her the most. I, I I was allowed to give her a nickname, and I nicknamed the ship Mama Bear. That was the nickname I gave to the ship. Yeah. So whenever I would talk to her, I would I would hear Mama Bear. And then I had a telepathic link with the uh, the navigator, so we were talking together. So it was almost like we were kind of all working together as one. Like he was he was weapons, and he was a uh, navigation, and I was pilot. So it's kind of like the same on our like fighters and stuff like that. It's like weapons navigation. And then you have, you, have, you have a pilot. You have two different people controlling the ship, pretty much. And, um, yeah, they had, you know, there was like a wreck time. They have like a, almost like something where they can kind of put you in a different world. You can put a headset on, and it feels like you're swimming in a lake in a different world. They have things like that. But then they also have like a, they had a family time, the, the Nordics, the, the Pleiadians, and like once a week probably about. There would be like a family time where they would all like stay with their kids. They would talk about their week. It was like a family bonding interaction thing. I would play guitar for them. They were amazed by things like music. We're one of the few beings. We're considered extremely creative. Whenever they first heard me hear like uh, play classical music, 
they were just like, how did you do that? Like, that was like what they said. Like, they didn't understand like how I did it. And yeah, it was just, they were very, they liked it. They were very amazed by it. I, I would play guitar for them. And yeah, it was just, you just got used to it. It was this, it became like a family life. There was a, a hydroponic farm on the ship. So they would, you would only eat like fresh vegetables and fruit. They had like a blue liquid for you to drink that gave you your proteins and your amino acids. But on their home world, they would eat fish. They ate lots of fish. So they wouldn't eat like beef or game, but they would eat fish and like uh, vegetables and, and fruits and things like that. So Solar Warden works closely with the Pleiadians then? Very close. Yeah, very close. Uh, the, the technology is mostly theirs. Uh, the materials are ours, like the titanium and things like that. And one of the deals is they can commandeer the ship anytime they want for any reason whatsoever. And they did do that one time that they took control of the ship. But yeah, that, that's part of the deal. And um, what, um, uh, I just thought of a question, but then I was listening to what you said and I lost it. Um, so their technology, uh, we work closely with them on the ship. I, what was that question? Um, it's going to bug me now. <laughs> um shoot what was it oh did did they use ai on the ship i heard there was a lot of argument about whether the fleet would take on aspects of ai or not but you said that there was some degree because you communicated with the with uh with mama bear yeah it, but she had to be a volunteer pretty much like there's male and female souls and things like that as well everything is like a duality like like there's there's male and female and everything and, and the, yeah and they they uh the ship actually had like a uh a living presence to it we're saying it was basically alive yeah and i can't, i got to a point where th they had us all three in the room the the, the navigator Tuaru, because she was like kind of almost like it was almost like star trek she was like spock kind of if that makes you know what i mean she was like she would look for anomalies and things like that in space and if she saw anything she would tell us Sure. Any anything, any kind of disruption that she could pick up, or she she saw or anything like that. So it was almost like that, and she was like, like in the back, just just like that. It's almost like that show, um, Farsight, mm -hmm. where the the ship was actually had like a living soul. So, but how would, I mean, that wouldn't be like a Palladian soul. What would what would that soul come from? It was a Palladian soul. Yeah, it, it was. It, it was, was a Palladian. Palladian and she had to volunteer herself for this. It was like it, it was like a part of your service. It was she volunteered for it. So they merged a, a volunteer Palladian with the ship. That's what they mm -hmm. did. Yeah, consciousness. Uh, yeah. Okay. Have you have you ever heard of a ship called Minerva? That was yeah. a. Yeah. Like I said, a, names are names are bad for me. It was what Robert yeah. told me in person that I remember. Like okay. the names that he told, like he told me mother's name was Sharai. I remember he yeah. said that. He he told me some of the names. Do you remember any of the other names of the of the the the, the battleships in the in the in the fleet? I don't. I don't. Yeah. So I've heard of like um, I heard there was just like you said Nimitz. I also heard, of course, there was a USS Enterprise. You know anything about that? I wouldn't be surprised at all about that. Yeah. Now, also uh, one that's frequently referred to was the um, um. Um, of course, I'm going to draw a blank all of a sudden on it. I could tell you any other time if I wasn't thinking about it. Another one they said was a was a dreadnought. They called a dreadnought. Um, I'm sure it's probably like some kind of beefed up class, of course, with that kind of name. Um, but then you got the one that uh, Good always talks about uh, and others. And that's the one I'm trying to remember. The um, the Nautilus. That's it. The oh, Nautilus. Right. That was a. Uh, that's one you hear about, like, you know, I've heard of that more more frequently than any other ship uh, in the fleet. But I did hear there was an Enterprise, and they do name them after, like, some of the ships we have here. And I, I was told that uh, when the fleet first started, it was eight, like, starships. And then they would have a complement of, it was just like an aircraft carrier subbed inside a submarine. And that it had uh, fighter craft, bombers, and, like, like uh, scientific uh, vehicles, you know, or troop transports kind of thing. So. And it works. It works almost like an amphib in the sense that um, there's a shield on the ship. The smaller ships have the same shield frequency, 
So it's not like you have to drop the shields like in Star Trek. They actually fly out of the back of the ship because it's at the same frequency. The, the, both the shields are the same frequency, that it, so they don't have to drop shields. They just fly right through. And you that, can actually see like space from yeah. like inside like this aircraft carrier kind of hangar area. That makes a lot of sense. That actually makes a lot of sense. Look, check out this video I showed. Um, Just like that, yeah, right into the back like that, yeah. It, it comes out of the back and not the front, yeah. Just like, kind of like, like I said, like a, like an amphib. Yeah, and those look like more circular kind of shaped craft. Yeah, and that's what they had. They had like the circular craft. And we got into like, we got into a, uh, a fight one time with the Draconians. And it was like a combination of like those craft and the larger starships all working together. And I remember the way it works is it's like frequency hopping. Uh, you know, like a, a radio pack almost. It's like the ship is so advanced, it kind of frequency hops and it sends out a resonance from its shields. Because you can't knock down the shield just like in, like, like in Star Trek and stuff like that because they're so powerful but, that you could fly in the stars. They use stars as like portals. There's also jumps and stuff like that in space. I've heard, I've heard Palladians say that. They say that the, uh, the stars, what you see as stars, they say we use as jump gates. Exactly. Yeah, they are. They are. And they have to be able to withstand that like kind of power from a, a star. So there's no way you can knock down the shields. So how, what it is, is the, the, the ship is sending out like waves of different frequencies from the, its shield. And if it, it hits the same frequency as the opposing ship, it'll knock the shields down. So it's almost like kind of hacking into its shield, it's kind of sending like blast waves out. And then once you knock their shields down, then you attack them. So it's almost like a waiting game kind of in the beginning where you're, you're frequency hopping. And mm. the smaller ships are, are maybe fighting because their shields aren't as powerful. But then once once they, uh, once they you hit that uh, type of frequency, the right frequency, then their shields go down and then you can attack. But it can also happen to you as well. Right, right. So here's a picture I wanted to ask you about. So in this picture right here, you see this, this older version TR-3B actually sitting on top of a carrier, correct? Mm-hmm. So a buddy of mine that worked in contracting and he worked in some underground dumps, he said he was actually on an aircraft carrier where they had one of these things on the deck. He said they cleared out the deck and he was allowed on the vehicle. And he said that what struck him is there was this strange, like when you went in the in, inside the cockpit area, there was a HUD, right? And on the on the display of the HUD, he said it was a strange language, and he says he was trying to look up what the language was or trying to make it out, and the pilot told him, he says, don't even try. He's like, you're not going to find what language that is, and he says, well, what language is it? And the pilot said it was a Nokian, uh, a Nokian magic, like the, uh, the syllables found in a Nokian magic that's used in like occult rituals, and he says that that's what was being displayed in, in this, this, this craft on, this, on the HUD. So do, do you ever see anything like that or no? Well, like I said, I didn't see the TR-3B, yeah. but I mean, like I said, it's a lot more spiritual than you think. Right. It's, it's technology. As I said, fifth density beings are more spiritually advanced and more technological advanced. So it works hand in hand. Yeah, it's like together. And it is like that. It is like you'll see kind of ruins or whatever like that in the ship every now and again, like on the on the walls of the ship and things like that. It's like a, it works hand in hand. It's really difficult. And that was something about fifth density that's really difficult to explain because it's like you're a higher consciousness. So it's like you kind of, I would sometimes go say 
five years into my own future and not even realize like I did it. And I was kind of living my life five years into this future. And my, my present self there realized it was happening. Like, oh yeah, I remember when this happened. And I would kind of live my life five years in the future and then I would come back. It was almost like time is an, an illusion. It's mm. more evident whenever you're like a higher consciousness like that. Mm. That's That's really interesting. I had a friend of mine who died and he said he went to heaven and came back. But the weird thing is he, he, uh, he was in a coma for like three days and then came, came out of, if I remember correctly, it was a short span of time, but he said that his perception of being up there was he lived an entire lifetime before he came back. And I wonder if it was similar to what you're saying in the fact that being that he was in a higher density, if you will, realm, that uh, the it, time played out differently in that sense, or, or, or his perception, or his his viewing of it, or experience of it. Even Saint Augustine um, of Hippo said that time is just an illusion; that it's not real; that uh, it's an illusion with a purpose; that we think it's linear when the truth is, on higher levels, it's not. It's not linear at all. So, um, but our perception of it is, especially in our lower conscious state, I guess, of perception. So I think it's really interesting you said that. What Do you remember what the deck looked like? So you you actually piloted the Nimitz, correct? So mm -hmm. as a pilot, like, what was your experience of that? What did the deck look like? You know, how many people were on it? Did, did would, What would screens look like or heads up display and that kind of thing? Did people well, the, use technology to, to operate it? How, how did all that work? I mean, th there was like a way you could view, um, but like uh, just a window. And they do have transparent aluminum, which they admitted they had, they invented like thir 30 years ago. But they use like oh, a... No, that was even window. in Star Trek. Yeah, yeah. They use, they use a transparent aluminum. But there's also like a... It's like a shutter slams down whenever you're at red alert. So it shuts down all the windows. There's like these titanium shutters that slam down. And you can just see like a holograms can just appear on on these ships. You don't, you don't need any kind of uh, no source of anything like that. They can just appear. So an actual hologram will just appear as far as what the window would have had, what, what you would have seen. So it's not like a screen on the wall. It's just kind of like a hologram appears. And that hologram is almost like a flat screen TV, like a big flat screen in front of you. And then that's what you that's what you're looking at and things like that. If you're not actually looking through the window. But if you but if, even if you want to see things that are far away, you want to see them close up. This hologram will just kind of like a TV screen will just appear right in front of you. So the captain can see it and everything else. And the captain sat almost like in a chair like you'd see in Star Trek and things like that. He sat in like a swivel chair by himself, like in the middle. And there was just other crew members around, yeah. And it was pretty much just like that. And I've heard like Gene Roddenberry like had connections. He had like a best friend, like a childhood friend that was part of Solar War, part of the Secret Space Program. That's where he got his ideas. They say there's so so many similarities that it can't be by coincidence. Exactly. But, um, it, was, it was yeah. It was pretty much like that. It was pretty much just like that. And we know that Hollywood a lot of times does you know disseminate information that way, like the movie Stargate. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. So one thing I heard before, and I, I would ask you uh, other other witnesses, they said that women, for whatever reason, often were on those decks and would use like devices or something where they would connect into the ship or readouts or stuff they were monitoring because they said they were found to be able to multitask better than men in a sense. And um, so they use them in a lot of like stations on the deck like that. Was that your experience at all or no? I mean, I don't remember that offhand, but I do remember it was about as, as many women as men. It was, okay. wasn't like, yeah, it was, it was about as many women working there as men. But, um, yeah, I don't remember that, like, wearing any kind of headsets or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a it's, that's amazing. I can't imagine what uh, what that was like. But from your – I don't know how much you remember from being on that program, but what – what would you think were the greatest threats that y'all had to deal with in that type of environment or situation? I mean, the Draconian Empire, there's also something called mantises. Yep. And mantises really aren't that, they really aren't, 
bad or anything like that. There's just so many of them because they reproduce just like an insect. And there's actually like a form of like a privateer, like a mercenary. They're they're like mercenaries and they'll attack your ships. And if they get, you know, uh, enough of whatever they want, whatever they want to trade. Yeah, they're like the mercenaries of space, like the mantises and things like that. The insectoid beings, because they breed like insects. There's so many of them, but most of them the, are peaceful. I heard some of the, the Germans in the dark fleet were like that, too. They just acted as like deep space pirates. Trying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th- that's the thing. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, there's mercenary. It's 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 kind of like here, but just more enlightened. There's corporations. Right. There's trade. Uh, you know. Yeah. Did these- you? I was told that th- this is the way. So, in the last show I did, I talked about the Nazis being the first off-world space fleet, then the the Solar Warden, but then I said that all the Black's company sites got together and built out their own globalist corporation that was known as the ICC, the International Corporate Conglomerate, and that they that it were involved in a lot, especially with trade and manufacturing of materials and stuff. Did you have any awareness or anything on them? Well, not on them, but trade in general, I remember, was huge with ETs. They uh, they liked our chocolate. They, 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 liked, they would get like uh, baker quality like cocoa. And big boxes and you get it from earth it would have like stuff written on it in english like i said we we're kind of like you know we, we were like uh like uh customs almost of like earth of our solar system so you right. saw everything going in and coming out they liked the uh, heineken beer i remember a lot of like they like beer yeah they, they, they like stuff like that they like our they like our trade that they, they trade with earth without us knowing and what else uh children's clothing because a lot of them are small, most of them are small, and they like our fat. A lot of them are like only like two or three feet tall, and they'll wear a lot of clothing from our world, diff- different ETs, things like that. Yeah, one thing I try to explain to people they have a hard time understanding is that um, it used to be that aliens would abduct humans for various reasons, whether slavery, genetic experiments, or food. And then um, Solar Warden pretty much put a stop to that, from my understanding. But then when our own government found out what a resource we were and how bad they wanted us, our own government started uh, cloning out humans or abducting humans and selling them off in trade to these races. Yeah. I I asked Robert, why do we deal with these things, these reptiles and greys? I I said, why do you, why do we deal with them? Why do you send people out? Why do you kidnap people? Why do you do this stuff? And he, all he said was we have a contract and that's what he said. Like we, we, and I'm guessing that's the Eisenhower contract. He didn't go yeah. into detail about it, but he did He did tell me we have a contract. Yeah, so what he's referring to for the audience, Eisenhower, it is said that um, when we first started making our contact with these races, that we signed a contract with them. And in that contract, we offered to allow the aliens to abduct a number of our population uh, in return for advancements in technology. And so it was basically like signing our soul away, making a deal with the devil. As long as we didn't remember and we got put back exactly where we came from. Yeah, that was like, and that's what it, the 20 year back is. Except for the one sold for food. Yeah, <laughs> or genetic, yeah. Or genetic experiments where they, you know, can turn you into other creatures like Nightmare Hall at, uh, at you know, at S4 or at Dulce Base. Rather, and that's how else they like us for is our our DNA is one of the most malleable, if not the most malleable in the universe. So they they love splicing our DNA. And I asked Robert about Max. I, I remember the spider, and the I said, uh, humanoid hybrid. Yeah, the the the, the chimera hybrid. Uh, yeah, humanoid hybrid, spider humanoid hybrid. And uh, he said to them, it's like building ships in a bottle. It's like making models. It's like a way to occupy their time. It's, it's something that is due for fun for a hobby. That's insane. <laughs> well, they don't seem to have our understanding or our, our, I guess, view of of a type of ethics and morality from that standpoint. In fact, and how Robert, would you describe that? Robert told me he said they see us as veal. They see us as cattle. That's how they, yeah. that's how they see us. They see us as food. They see us as something to be used, something abused. They see us the same way as we see like livestock that we eat. It still boggles my mind that a fifth density being 
would would still be that low based and understanding of of intellect you know what i mean as as opposed to i would think there's a as a being raises in its consciousness that it would also raise in its its understanding of of empathy or um or or you know love for other creatures or other life forms you know what i'm saying many do but i mean like i said a reptile is a reptile you're, you're talking about a reptilian brain you know what i mean it, they don't have empathy they don't have any of that it's a reptilian brain something looks similar but like i said right at the elbows it got it got real hairy like wiry spider hair and it only had like two like little prongs like little, two little black claws for hands and but its eyes were normal but they were black but then instead of like being on the forehead, they kind of went up the sides and gradually got smaller as they went up the sides. And just like a, a, hair. like a spider. And they said they would feed the kids to that, right? In those cages? Yeah, yeah. They would feed the kids. You know, they would. And, he, and I asked him if it was intelligent. He said it had around a 60 IQ. He said somewhat. He said it had around a 60 IQ. So, And it was weird because. It was standing there. There was like bars, you know, it was kind of embedded into like the cave and there were bars in front of it. Like its cell was embedded in the cave and there were bars. And it was just staring at the wall in front of it, just like a spider would. Like it was completely motionless. You know mm. what I mean? But I could see the eyes on the side of its head. So, so I knew it could see me. Yeah. Right. And it was, but it was just dead motionless like a spider would be. Yeah. Like it did not move. Do you recall any other strange creatures or hybrids like that? I mean, I saw so much stuff. Like I said, I when I was on that um, when I was on that space station, like like that, you know, United Nations kind of like peace area. Th uh, there was most of it was small. Most of it was like a foot, maybe a foot and a half tall, and they were kind of scurrying around, running everywhere, just different ETs and uh, the taller beings like us. It was almost like an unsaid rule. They walk very slowly so they wouldn't like kick them. It was like, you know, like higher being, like, like like the taller beings, like like six foot beings and above. They would kind of walk very slowly so they wouldn't accidentally bump into them or kick them. And all right. these things were just zipping around everywhere. These little things, yeah. Did you ever see any of the mantises in person? Yeah, the mantises are on Mars. They're they're I would say the closest to humans in the sense that. Um, If, if they invite you into their home, they would they would offer you a seat. They would offer you something to eat and drink. Like I said, most ETs, you have to ask for stuff. They would offer stuff. They they had a good sense of humor. They would laugh quickly. Did they have a hive mind? Uh, much more than us. Very telepathic. Uh, very good. They're experts at genetically genetic engineering. That's what the reptiles wanted them for. We would, we would pick them up. We would we would go into their homes and ask peacefully. I would go in and ask peacefully, and if it if it said no, then I would have to take it. And they, and would, what, they would explain quickly. What was your time and experience like on Mars? What was that like? So they had bases there. There was bases, I, but mostly I dealt with just going after mantises. That was mostly they lived in almost like adobe kind of huts, almost like rounded huts. And when you say go out, out of the clay, huh? was that like in a in a military way or just like contact way or? It was almost like a reconnaissance way. Yeah, they gave you these suits that completely like cloaked and made you completely invisible, like like invisible, invisible. And I would have to try to get these mantises, and um, they would actually make these little beetles. They were genetically engineered, or they're about the size of a football. And, you know, like a few of them's not dangerous, but they would send like a thousand of them at you at a time, and they could completely like. Uh, telepathically control them and they would kind of go up like a carrier pigeon they would circle around a couple times and then it would come down at you and you could just run that's all you could do is run away and they were they would run into the caves a lot of time there were caves on mars and there were large spiders like about three meters in diameter about nine to ten feet and they could uh, telepathically uh, control them mm -hmm. the spiders yeah I've heard about the spiders. They say they're the size of like uh, Volkswagens. Yeah, they're yeah they're about nine ten feet, and like with the legs and everything. So you wore the uh, you wore the exoskeleton suits in the program. Mm -hmm. So and what was your capacity there? If you're a pilot, why did they have you involved in uh, basically soldiery stuff? As soon as they found out that I had experience in the Middle East, 
they put me they they put me down on um, Mars, and I became almost like a sergeant or a chief. I started breaking in like German officers, new people. I was like the guy that, and then I became like I started working. With, I was doing that back and forth, but they wanted me on the ground because they found that I experienced in the Middle East. And what what can you describe of the technology other than the invisibility cloaking of the uh, exoskeleton suits? Well, I mean, like I said, it had a consciousness that it could talk to you. You, okay. you would actually hear a voice in your head and stuff like that. It had a consciousness. Your weapon had a consciousness. They would use things like rail guns, like they use on Navy ships, except for they had them in rifle size. I've the heard of the like, Yeah, it was about the size of a crayon, the round. I've, I've heard about many of the different weapons platforms, but they said pretty much the, the number one favorite was the rail gun. Yeah, that's... If you were expecting vehicles, they would have like laser and plasma. But if you were only expecting personnel, it would just be railgun. Right. Yeah, they said just uh, you know heavy projectiles just cause the most damage overall. Other than exactly, because if you hit somebody with a laser in the shoulder, it, it cauterizes it. Cauterizes. But if you hit somebody with a. It, it had three lines going down it, the round. So when it hit, it, it had the accuracy of, of a sniper rifle. But when it hit you, it splattered off into three pieces and would pretty much leave like a shotgun size hole out the back of you. So it, right. it was very accurate. But then once it hit you, it split apart and splattered and ripped the hole out the back. Yeah, that's amazing. That A lot of people talk about the high advancedness of the, uh, of those suits and how impressive they are. And uh, Randy Kramer talked about this a lot in his time. And he was one of the first sources to come out talking about this many years ago. And he said that, uh, he talked about the evolution of the suits, how when it first started off, it had a battery pack that was like the size of like, uh, you know, a battery in your car, car battery, deep cell. But he says over time, it got smaller and smaller to where it was like a matchbox, you know? Mm -hmm. And yet that matchbox, if you had to, you could turn that sucker into almost like a nuclear explosion, you know? So, um, but it was crazy. Uh, talked about how the suits had ways to, like treat you if you had wounds, like uh, automatic tourniquets or foam to fill in like uh, wounds, you know, to help preserve you. Um, and yeah, could could regulate your entire, you know, biometric system and your health as well with the heads up display that can you could communicate, see the battlefield, uh, target acquisition or or contact with, um, you know, even the the starship above or even uh, with the intelligence section. So. Uh, not to mention your own uh, your own crew. So. Yeah, the the the, uh, the tech in your body and um, and the suit would work together if you were wounded to keep you alive. Yeah, because you already had the tech in your body, and that could actually you know that can help you heal quicker. It can also help you with uh, oxygen, running oxygen through the body, make you run faster, make your muscles stronger. They would do all that stuff. All the tech in your body. He said he had his blown, he had his head blown off before and cut off in battles with reptilians or mantids. But he said that they had technology with those med med beds that could just rebuild you back. They said they had a soul. If you had a soul connection that lasted for like 30 minutes after your death. And they said, as long as they could get to you before that, you, they could bring you back. You know, even with your head blown off. He, he said that um, they built out these uh, pods medical pods that they'd bring out in the field or have close at hand to where if you got hurt, they could put you in there and it'd put you in a form of stasis for a prolonged period until they could get back you to a, a med bed or something. So Yeah. Yeah. Robert told me the same thing when I was talking to the office, he said you were killed the third day you're on Mars. <laughs> yeah, and I, I kind of went through like a, a crisis, you know yeah, what I mean? Of like, it, well, it's, it's like, almost, me, like yeah, it's like, almost like I... a, it's almost like your initiation. You have to be killed before you know you move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, I said, well, what's the point? Like, it's not even me. It's just like a copy of me. It's not even the real Daryl. I was like, why shouldn't I just kill myself? He's like, Daryl, you don't understand that. I said, what? He said they were able to salvage your consciousness, and I said, what's that? And he said, your soul. If that makes you feel any better, he said they made an exact clone of your body in every way. And they put the part that makes you you back in that body. So it's they can tra they they claim they have the ability to transfer your soul. So if you make a clone body and put your soul in it, then it's the same as what you are right now. It's no different whatsoever. Exactly. Uh, but you know, when somebody tells you that, it's like, yeah. what the? It's like, and I even said, like, so the Daryl my mother gave birth to, his bones are rotting on Mars. You said, right. yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's a that's a that's a crazy wild concept to try to wrap your head around. You know, <laughs> know. Um, there was there was one story I heard one time where they said someone died on the field, but because they already had clones of them on the ship, the soul was able to find its way back to one of those clones and reconnected and came back, and everyone was like, "What the hell?" <laughs> like, like they like it, it was completely an anomaly, but but happened on on like super rare occasion. You know what I'm saying? Because they said they already had these clones of you on the ship in case something happened to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what he told me. Yeah, yeah. he said sal he said they were able to salvage your consciousness. That's yeah, like exactly and, and it makes a lot. It's like the movie Avatar in a sense, um, where you're you're switching your consciousness into another being um, that has a genetic match to your code and frequency, just like you were talking about with the shield. You know, why does my hand not go through my other hand? Because it's electromagnetic frequency that's actually repelling. The, the molecules and atoms away from each other, right? So that they don't merge, right? So it's the same It's the same thing on a different level. We all have an electromagnetic consciousness that locks us not only into our body, but into this location in time. Yeah, because your DNA and your soul are also connected as well. So it makes sense if, you know, you, you did die and there was a clone close by that the, the consciousness would be able to find that because that, that that's kind of like one and the same, you know what I mean? The DNA itself and the, it's, like your, your your consciousness, your DNA are kind of like one and the same. It's part of who you are on both aspects, not just not just your physical. They also said so. If you went down on a planet and you came across something unknown that was toxic, that was like eating away at your flesh or something, well, they could transfer again your soul to the other clone body, and you're good to go. So it was almost like a skin suit. And then, um, and then another thing is, they said they would also create clones of you that were hybrids that they could put your consciousness in um, so that you could communicate with a different species um, better. Like they might have different vocal cords or, or just so that you look closer to them to be able to communicate and interact with them on a, on a, you know, a, uh, a diplomatic level, if you will, you know what I'm saying? So uh -huh. they said there was a lot of that going on too, where they could, they could, you know, put you in other things. It wasn't necessarily, it was still your DNA. And but it wasn't necessarily human. It was a hybrid. And then they would just put you back in your normal thing later, you know. But that's what a lot of people talk about, like the grays today, about how most of them are just biological skin suits for different races. So, you know, if you see grays, they, they could be any race or even humans. People even talk like Stephen Greer talks about. We've had politicians that were abducted by UFOs that had little grays on them or nothing more than intelligence agencies that were operating these little things. And you couldn't tell the difference. It's not an alien from a different world. And it's telling them about what treaties they should sign in Congress. You know what I'm saying? Oh, this is for a galactic, you know, things is huge. Please sign the line. You know what I mean? So it's like there's been a lot of manipulation going on with this. Well, I mean, come on. If you have technology, no one else has. You know, uh, it's it stands to reason you're going to abuse it. You know, just yeah. I remember the drones had almost like a, a hive mind consciousness. They didn't. They really didn't have like an individual consciousness. It was almost like a hive mind consciousness. They they were like kind of like the uh, maintenance workers in the dark fleet. You'd see them scurrying around doing like preventive maintenance on the ship. When you say drones, what do you mean by that? Like this was uh, automated or, or or biological or. Yeah, like biological, but they look kind of synthetic. That first thing I saw, the, the light brown thing with the fold of skin and the big black eyes, Robert called those drones. Mm. That's what they call them, yeah. Like the, the grays, but like the brown grays, they call right. them drones, yeah. And what was their level of IQ? I mean, were they just workers or were they really intelligent? I mean, they're machines. Like, like I said, that woman, April, I knew, uh, we all went out to Plymouth in England one time. And this is how I remember this. And she said, uh, yeah, don't ever get your tooth knocked out because I have an implant right here. She's talking about she had got like a titanium screw screwed up in her implant and, a, you know, screw, you know, a tooth screwed onto it. And I remember on the moon, she said, I, I was missing a tooth, but they grew it back. She said they can grow anything back here. I remember her telling me that. And I remember asking Robert, I was like, well, you know, I remember that story she told me, like she had like she had her tooth. So what happens when you get age regress? She, I said, did her tooth just fall out? He said, yeah. He said, everything comes back. Scars come back. If you're missing a tooth, that falls out. And I, I said, well, 
how do they get the implant back in, the tooth implant back in? He said one of the drones did it. He said they could do it. They're like, they could take, they're like computers. They're like machines. They could just make, take an image of exactly where that was placed, what it looked like. You come back, which to them is, you know, you come back like a week in advance to get age regress. Then you go directly to the drones and the drones touch up your body. So it looks exactly like it did before. So they screwed the titanium screw back into her. They screwed the tooth back in and they sent her back. What's wild is how do they age regress your mind, not just wipe it, but age regress it back to the level of being a child or a young person. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, yeah, I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's almost like it's, it's less of an age regression the way you explained it to me. It's almost like they take a picture of your, like what you look like then and you go right back to that. Yeah. So but you, mentally even, yeah. Like, you still have the same consciousness. And your mind, so you're, so you're, you're still have that mindset of whenever you first, join the program and before you got your mind wiped you're, that is you're right at that level you're supposed to that is wild so you you knew april when you came back as well yeah she was like a she was a an it she was like a, a computer she fixed the com computers on the base i knew her she lived in the barracks she was, she was one of the she was in the navy yeah like uh, many of the people on the base would join the program yeah and they wouldn't even know it and it was like this weird secret for the guys who didn't join it those are the guys that were sent to monitor you to see if you remember. They were, mm. they were, they were told to like, go, Hey, go hang out with this guy. See if he remembers anything, have a few drinks with him, see if he says anything just to make sure. And if you had memories, they would try to get you to go back in the chair, but it's almost like they couldn't force you to go. It's like you signed the contract to go once. Mm. You know what I mean? They would take you into the office, say, look, this is happening to you. You need help. You know, you need to go back to this chair. This is going to destroy your life. This is going to wreck your life. You need to get rid of these memories. Because I remember there was a girl, a woman who, uh, she was just drinking all the time. And she was actually one of the women that was like in the brothels on the moon. So she had a really hard time. She had her baby taken away from her. And, you know, every time she had a baby, it was just taken from her. And, uh, yeah, I mean, she had memories of this. And she was just drinking all the time. And she was just a mess. You know what I mean? An absolute mess. She couldn't. Get, it's like she Tony couldn't Rodriguez. Tony Rodriguez in his story said he didn't want to leave at the end because he was so attached to the, the girl he met in the brothel, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And he just, yeah. he didn't want to leave her, but I didn't uh, want to leave in the end either. Yeah. I, I had people that I cared about. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Even Randy Kramer, I believe said that he had had, um, he had had a wife off planet and children with them that that's very common in the, in the space program. Well, that's I, what Robert. Yeah. I, I said to him, I said, 20 years is a long time. Will I be able to have children? And he, and he said, with your scores, you'll be expected to have children. Right. And I said, will I ever be able to see them again? And he said, no, he said, but they'll be taken care of. And I said, well, that sounds really sad. <laughs> Do they, they ever promise you know. Do they ever, ever promise you after your service there that they would help take care of you now in any way? Well, I mean, Robert said, he just put it like this. He said, you're under protection. And it sounded like, because he, he said that higher density beings can manipulate lower densities. And uh, I've had close calls and maybe that was a Kino, but I've, I've also had close, I've also been helped out a lot too. So I, I think mm -hmm. like a higher density being is kind of looking out for me or a group of higher density beings because I've had some close calls. Right, right. That's awesome. Well, um, I've been on here for uh, three hours and uh, <laughs> I, know. I don't want to, I don't want to take up, you know, too much of your time, your generous time. Um, but uh, like you said before, I mean, there's so much information to unpack here. That's very hard to do even in two hours. You know what I mean? Like uh, uh, there's, there's a lot more questions I have and a lot more we could go into. And, but you know, that audience too can only handle so much at once. And this is probably way over most people's heads of being able to understand or accept anyway. So um, I've been at this a long time and, and, uh, and, 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 and know a lot, you know, stories. So it gives me a, a good base solid to understand everything you're saying and where you're coming from. But, uh, but there, I want to thank you so much for coming on. And like I said, being so generous with your time, it's, uh, it's such a pleasure to be able to, to have the opportunity to speak to someone that's been in the 20 and back because there are so few people that uh you know they've got they do a good job with this program there's so few people that uh come back and remember anything of their time with these programs or willing to go public and talk about it but i think it's extremely important for people to understand and know 
um, some of the things that that goes on and with the level of technology our government actually has today and how that's employed and and how much we're left in the dark as a as a species and a people, you know, and um, and and how how often we're so easily manipulated, you know, and, and we're controlled as to what we're allowed to believe, what we're allowed to say or talk about, you know, all these different things. So it, I think it's uh, it's it's very important in and in, in, you know information for people to to understand even if that doesn't mean they have to believe everything or anything they can have takeaways from from whatever they want that that can lead them on a path that they can try to research or study or go down on their own to try to to wrap their heads around this kind of stuff you know um but uh but i'm sure the audience will be extremely excited to hear about a lot of this information in your story so thank you very very much for coming on um yeah and like I said, I'm writing a book. I'm in the mid, I'm probably about 40% done. And um, my website is Daryl, D A R Y L, D is in Delta, James.com. So Daryl D. James.com. Daryl D is in Delta, James.com? Yeah, James.com. I'll post that. And I have all kinds of videos. I mean, I've been doing it for a few years now. Right, right. And you're going to be in a conference soon, too. Is that right? Well, yeah, I'm going to one in Texas. And uh, okay. I, I don't know if they want to kind of keep that. It, it almost seems like they wanted to make it a surprise for their audience or something. Okay. But, I mean, yeah, I was going to, uh, yeah, I've, I've got, but uh, yeah, I've, I'm going to the conferences. One seems like it's kind of falling apart. That happens sometimes. People mm. are bailing out at the last second. Mm. Yeah, that one's happening in like St. Pete, Florida. And yeah, so, but we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. Okay. Yeah. Well, sounds good. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank, Thank you. you, audience, for for watching another show. And I'm sure you'll find this one as fascinating as I did. And uh, we'll see you next time. Keep the lights on.